G'day everyone, welcome to Ruin Hammer Season 2, Episode 46. Thanks so much for all you guys for joining us, uh, joining us tonight, a special, another special night. Hey mate, how are you going? How's, how's your first week of freedom been? Yeah, good mate. Yeah, it's, um, still need a haircut and a shave, but uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> good. it's good to see the sunshine again. I've come, come out from a hibernation, uh, ready to to get back in the world. Uh, how about yourself, mate? How's the week been? Yeah, pretty busy. Uh, you know, working hard, uh, training hard, eating well, trying to do all the good things. So yeah, uh, back playing touch again. So yeah, pretty happy about that. Always good to get out and get active. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, mate, we have another one of those shows we absolutely love, and that is a live chat with a former warrior. Absolutely, we do. Mate, why don't you bring him in and uh, I'll Let's tell you a little bit about him. Um, tonight's guest played 158 NRL games during his 10-year career, including 35 games over two seasons at our beloved Warriors. Uh, played in two NRL grand finals, including the Warriors' 02 grand final appearance and four origins for Queensland. Uh, make him welcome. Welcome to the Warrior 96, PJ Marsh. Hey, PJ, how are you, bro? Yeah, always good, guys. It's a pleasure to be on. No worries, mate. Great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll we'll wind it right back to the start of your career. Um, can you tell us where you grew up and uh, who was your junior club? Yeah, I grew up, uh, I suppose, in a mix between two places. I was played my first game of football in, in Gladstone and was born in Gladstone uh, as an eight-year-old, played my first game, and but uh, soon after moved out to Blackwater and that's pretty much where I, I grew up uh, before heading off to boarding school. Yeah, and I, played I, for the Wallabies. Actually, they were called uh, the Wallabies. I've read in I've read in previous interviews that you went to school in Blackwater, and and I'll quote you here from an interview I read uh, where you said you're unable to get a Year Ten certificate because you needed to turn up for school. You weren't a fan of school back then, mate. <laughs> I lived across the road, so it was pretty, pretty straight across the straight across the road. Uh, as soon as uh, Mum and that went off to work or wherever they're going. And sometimes mum would be at home, and I'd often jump the fence and just go back home. So <laughs> I had a basketball hoop in the front yard, but the worst thing about it was is teachers could see me playing basketball all day. <laughs> that was my first dream. I wanted to be an NBA player, but I never grew past five foot tall. So, you know, that was... Yeah. <laughs> oh, you could have been a point guard. could have been a Muggsy Bogue-style point guard. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't even have the skill, really, so we won't even go there. Okay, no worries. <laughs> um, you played. You played for the... I was going yeah, to say, go on, you sorry. found yourself at St. Brendan's College, uh, Yapoon, as a boarder. Um, you know, some other NRL stars like uh, Paul Bowman, Julian O'Neill, uh, Ben Hunt, Dave Taylor, Matty Scott all went there. I guess living at school makes it easier to attend. Yeah, look, I, it was, yeah, it does help. <laughs> Pretty hard to hide. But uh, look, the biggest thing for me going off to St. Brandon's, it, it was a rugby league. It was known and it still is known. It's, I, I, I'm biased. I think it's the best rugby league school in Queensland. And uh, obviously it, uh, it, was, it was like heaven for me, loving sports, loving rugby league. Uh, I was really fortunate. Um, had six kids in the family. Um, and I know that, you know, boarding schools aren't cheap. And I, I, I remember it was pre I was pretty fortunate. Um, that I had a principal at Blackwater State High. He actually was one of the ones that, and another teacher, former teacher, they were really instrumental in uh, getting me to St. Brendan's because obviously it was going to be difficult for mum and dad to afford a boarding school um, for myself. So they they wrote a letter to the principal of uh, St. Brendan's at the time. I still got the letter. And he said, you know, we've got a kid here. He loves his football. Um, and, you know, I, I think that he would do well in that environment. And, you know, the rest is history. They come up with a deal, you know, with mum, what we could afford. And I went off to school and, uh, you know, it was a really memorable uh, time in my life. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah. You played for the Central uh, Queensland Capras back in 98 um, and you were named in the Capras team of the century. Um, what was your time like playing there and representing the region? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm fond of that time. It was it was a really um, sort of whirlwind sort of start for me. Um, I missed out at school not getting sort of scholarships and seeing a bunch of friends get um, scholarships slash contracts to go to clubs. And, and I it was my dream since I was eight years old to do and play in the uh, 
Winfield Cup as it was way back, and um, then the NRL <laughs> shows my age. Um, <laughs> but you know, it was a dream one, and, and that sort of broke me a little bit. And I remember just sort of not so much giving up on my dream, but just sort of thought, well, this is life. I'm, I'm gonna just you know play local football maybe. And it wasn't until, as I said, boys, cut me off if you have to, but it's a pretty interesting no. story. Like. Um, the current, oh, he just stepped down, Paul White, the CEO of the um, Brisbane Broncos yeah. for the last, you know, however many years. He he was um, coaching um, Rockhampton Brothers at the time. And I went to school with his brother-in-law, Tom Busby, which is, um, I don't know if anyone follows music, Busby Maru. And Paul White ended up um, giving me a call and said, mate, um, I've heard you play footy. Would you come play for Brothers? And it turned out that... Uh, Signed up for under 19s, but uh, never sort of played one game in the 19s. I, I trained really hard in that off season, and Paul White come to me and said, "Mate, you, you've trained really hard." He goes, "I wouldn't have a clue whether you can play football or not, but you deserve a chance." Uh, and he gave me a chance in the pre-season, so I did start sort of my career in senior football um, with Rockhampton Brothers, yep. and then after about 10 games, um, went went on to you know, start playing for the Capras at the, at the time. So, so it, was, yeah, it was pretty full on. There was lots in between there that happened and, and I was a fullback. So that was... Oh, were you? Fullback. A lot of people oh. don't know. Yeah, I played fullback. I went down to Parramatta and trolled at fullback and everything. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh. So, well, 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 that leads me to my next question. So how did you end up being signed by Parramatta? Well, as I said, I started out at um, the at the brothers club and was playing really good football there and after about seven or eight games they had a lot of people that come over from the western reds the coach was formerly from there and they brought a lot of players in that weren't locals and a lot of them sort of they won one game from 10 and a lot of the players well not a lot a fair few players were just a little bit like oh it's probably not for me living in rockhampton um we're losing you know so there was a number of players that left the club and they come looking at local local talent. And uh, as I said, I started the season quite well. You know, it started with a trial match uh, versus Mackay Brothers that had Martin Bella, Jason Martin, um, yeah. you know, many of good players and they'd spent a fortune on their team. And Paul White never backed down from anything. He's like, yeah, we'll take them on. Let's take them. So it started with a trial match playing quite well. Then I went through to, yeah, the, the, the Capras and... Uh, I remember the day that they rang me up, like I said, I, I said that I wasn't really keen on playing for them. Uh, as I didn't see it as a pathway, I saw it as a, they've won one game out of 10. And I don't know, and that brothers, we hadn't lost a game. We were, we had a really good season. I'm thinking, I'm having fun over here. I'm not trying to have fun when I'm getting flogged by 40 every week. And, uh, and, and I said to Paul White, he come and told me that they wanted me to go over as well because I'd had a phone call. But then he um, also said, look, you're meant, to go, you're meant to go to training with the Capras. And I said, oh, I'm not real keen. And he said, PJ, what I've seen of you in the you know the first 10 rounds or so, mate, I think you're, you're half a chance of actually, you know, making a bit of a go at football, mate. He goes, you've just been really good. And um, he said, so I'm not going to pick you. You're not playing for us this week. So he sort of threw me sort of like an ultimatum, not playing for brothers. And he probably would have let me, but he just sort of said, look, I don't, I, I don't want to hold you back, mate. I think you should go. So I went and played for him uh, that week and told almost every single person I know that it just happened to be a TV game and I'm playing for the Capras. I'm going to be on TV. And yeah. we got beat by nearly 50, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I still remember the game. Uh, there was a big Blake Lima. It might have been Denny Lima's brother, a big Polynesian guy, massive legs, and he played on the wing. And as I said, I seriously told everyone, because there used to only be one one TV game a week, and it was on a Saturday, I believe, at 2 o'clock. So I told everyone. A ABC everyone, game, everyone, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cousins, uncles, and I've got a billion you know, relatives. So they all, people were watching, and um, I remember the first sort of interaction I had was this Lima running down the sideline, and... Uh, I've come across, as I said, I was fullback, and I've come across and they've just commentated, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, wow, Marsh didn't really stand a chance there, did he, the young fella? Because he just he just sort of more went bang, Melman me, 
<laughs> straight out the top of me, ran down under the sticks and yeah, tree trunks. <laughs> oh, was, and then the next, the same thing happened probably ten minutes later. But this time, I held onto his leg and he dragged me for ten meters and still straight down and scored. <laughs> so I thought to myself, well, even if I did want to play for brothers, I'm probably going to be back there next week after this game. But yeah. Uh, I suppose they were getting flogged by 40 and 50 every week, so it wasn't. I don't think um, it was exactly my fault. But uh, we ended up having a good back end of the season and talking about how I got the para. Um, look, we ended up winning seven out of ten games. We beat um, we beat Burley in the back end of the year. We beat Redcliffe Dolphins uh, out at Capella, which is a little Central Highlands town near where I'm from. So it was pretty. It was that was probably one of the most special wins I've had uh, in sort of my whole career. Uh, we won by two, we won on the bell. and um, Yeah, and then at the end of the year, one rookie of the year for the Capras. And they just said, um, Ross O'Reilly, good friend of mine now. And he was, um, he wasn't the coach, I believe he was like the CEO or something or like that at the time. And he, he knew Noel Clear, which was at the crime uh, yeah. from the Parramatta Eels at the time. And he yep. said, look, you know, there's a kid here that's been playing quite well. He's only 17, just turned 18. He's been playing state league. And um, uh, look, he's coming down. He's won Rookie of the Year. We're going to take him to the grand final and all the rest of it. And Noel Cleal said, well, tell him to bring his boots and we might give him a trial. And an open. back then, you could have an open trial. Like They just advertise it and anyone could turn up. So I've been playing state league and playing quite well at fullback. And I went down to the trials and to the grand final and... Noel Cleal picked me up from the airport. So I was already blown away that Noel Crusher Cleal, like, I, you know, yeah. I watched this guy and yeah. I'm thinking, it was a little bit before my time, but I just remember watching a lot of highlights of him and I'm thinking, this guy's just picking me up from the airport, like, where, well, yeah, you know? And then uh, we went out and I had the uh, open trials and as I said, anyone could turn up and I there and they even make their contracted uh, Jersey flag side, which is 19's play on the day, just to really bolster the the quality yep. um, because there were some guys there that yeah they they probably shouldn't have even been there but uh you know they they just had all the gear but they yeah they, they were just there having a go but there was obviously then the talented players that were there um, but i turned up there and I, as i said i was a fullback and i sat there for the first 20 the second 20 and there was you know they were playing 20 minutes extension there was only one left and noel Cleal came up to me and he just goes who are you I was sitting down and he goes, have you even been on? I said, no. And he goes, and he goes, why not? And I go, oh, they said that um, the fullback that they've got, he played New South Wales schoolboys or something last year and he's already signed and we've got a fullback. And sort of, so I sort of got bullied in the way of sitting there because I was nervous anyway. But uh, he goes, can you play anywhere else? I said, oh, I'll play anywhere. Don't worry, mate. <laughs> and then he, so I jumped up and in the last 20 minutes, um, yeah, went out and played five eight and scored two tries and set up a, another guy for three and literally after the game, hopped in Crusher's Clear and my older brother, my oldest brother, come to you know watch and Noel Clear just started driving off from the field and goes, mate, um, we want to sign you up. We think we want you to come down here and play there. And my brother's doing the elbow on me like that. <laughs> I, was, I, I was just playing it cool. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> And Noel like yeah. no, Cleo's looked in the rear vision me. I remember it like it was yesterday. He looks at me and goes, what? No one who's not, not happy about that? <laughs> Harris not your team? Or... <laughs> and I'm just like, ah, 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 I'm keen, I'm keen. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they literally signed us up and um, went down there that off-season. Um, in the, pretty much, yeah, ready for the 99 season. That, uh, um, that experience leaving home must have been daunting, though. Uh you know, to come down and, and live in the big smoke down in Sydney, play for the Eels? Yeah, it was. And especially being by myself, I didn't, I was, it wasn't like there was another young fella there or something that I knew. It, it was pretty scary. And uh, yeah, only being 18 at the time, I, I remember I lived across the road from the Parramatta Leagues Club and they used to come out there at the nightclub and there'd always be big stinks on, you know. And Jicks. I remember one night just look, <laughs> looking over the balcony edge like this, thinking if they see me, are they going to come and murder me and <laughs> because we're talking about a nightclub that you know fits nearly a thousand people and that just you know we're in Sydney in Parramatta in the middle of Sydney and I was just like I was pretty scared I lived with Eric Grove Jr for a little while that was pretty wild but uh yeah look it um it was pretty scary heading down there uh but 
as I said, it's all I've ever wanted to do since I was, uh, you know, since I was 18, like eight years old, and I was 18 at the time. I just thought, well, this is like a dream come true. I'm gonna be able to train and and you know get paid possibly for football. You know, the, when they said they'd sign me out for 10 grand or 15 grand, I thought I was getting that money. <laughs> turns, out that, uh, turns out that uh, my free living was about six of that for the year. Oh. My, my medical to be a like top health fund was another three or four. So I actually got no money. <laughs> but, but they gave me a traineeship and I was a, a greenkeeper on the stadium. I actually loved that. Um, and I went uh, went there and done that. So that was $218 a week. So that, that's what I was living on and thought I was killing it. <laughs> so, yeah, quite interesting. It was, it's, it's quite funny because I, I know the year later, have to go forward a bit, but in 2000, we done a time capsule. Well, we done a time capsule in 1988 at my little primary school. And 2000, yeah. they opened it, and every little kid had to write something on it. And I wrote on it um, that uh, I'll be playing in the Winfield Cup for the Brisbane Broncos, but if I can't play for them, I'll be the uh, greenkeeper so I can get free tickets to watch the game. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and at the time, I was a greenkeeper playing for the Parramatta Eels. So it was quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Close, close. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, you, make, you make your NRL debut uh, for Parra in the 2000 season in the round 12, 26-23, lost to Newcastle at Newcastle, and you were playing halfback that day. Um, what do you remember about the week uh, that you were told you were going to play, and what do you remember about the game itself? I only remember a couple of things from the game, but, uh, yeah, making my debut when I got told how I felt, uh, gee, it's, it's pretty scary for one marathon stadium. I'd only played twice there before. And that was uh, once in reserve grade, once in the under 19s. And, um, they hate everybody. <laughs> they, <laughs> they can be pretty brutal the yelling stuff out, like, you know, you like kill him. And you, you think, <laughs> think some of them might've actually meant let's try killing. Uh, <laughs> You know, by the end of the under-19s, they've normally got about 10,000 people there and it's really noisy, which, you know, yeah. is quite phenomenal. So I knew we were going there. And look, it was I got told early in the week, Jason Smith was playing Origin at the time, uh, old power player, Bulldogs player. Yeah, uh, legend. Was it, Raiders, Bulldogs, everywhere. Yeah, and you know, he was obviously an amazing, um, amazing football player. So he played Origin that... Um, that week and Brian Smith said, look, he's gonna be playing where, you know, as much as he thinks he's going to and he wants to, uh, I'm not letting him, so you're you're gonna be playing. And I was just like, yeah, and he goes, you can't say anything for a little while. Um, and funny enough, I'd been playing really, really well that season in reserve grade to start the year. I actually, out of the first, uh, I think it was something like nine games, I, I'd had like six man of the matches and, um, and we were a really good reserve grade side as well. So we were winning and uh, I'd been picked that the week before my debut, I, I was picked in the New South Wales uh, reserve grade uh, team to play before the origin. And obviously Queensland, that didn't sit well with me. So I just went over and I said to the guys, there's no way I'm playing for New South Wales. And they were like, hey, that's big, that's big. That's, that's the before. spirit, yeah. I was like, shitting me, I said, I'm Queenslander. I said, that's not happening. So and it turns out that um, back then they, they tried to put like a bit of a ban. Uh, you'd get suspended for two weeks, I believe, if you didn't play uh, with no no reason. So um, I went into camp. Brian Smith, he just sort of said to me, he goes, well, you're making a debut, mate. And I just went, nah, it's all good. So I went into camp and I just said to the uh, the coach and stuff, and I shook hands and they gave me, they said, get your bag and everything. I said, oh, look, oh, no, nah, I don't want to get it. Um, I'm not going to play. <laughs> and he goes, and that was before I knew about this two week ban. He's like, what do you mean? I said, mate, I'm in Queensland. I'm not New South Wales. I'm not playing. And um, the coach at the time, they all, the coaching staff were all there shaking hands, congratulating her. And they looked at me a little like, is this bloke for real? <laughs> and in my head, I'm thinking, mate, 100%. There's no way I'm pulling that blue jersey. And they said, look, we'll talk to you. We'll talk to you a bit later, mate. And they said, looking at me like that. <laughs> and so they, you had to do a medical back then. They get you into camp. So I've jumped up on the table, medical, and he's going through my knee. And I had a lot of trouble with my knee the first season I was 
down there and I, I knew a lot of symptoms to toss up if I was injured. And uh, <laughs> I said, mate, yeah, that hurts. Yeah, it's no good. Turns out, I, I said, look, I'm no good to play. It's it's pretty painful. And that that afternoon, <laughs> they they officially ruled me out um, injured. So, <laughs> uh, but the funny thing about that was is, well, because they were going to play on the Wednesday night, so I still had the time, but they still made me get the photo. They said, look, come talk to us after, but, you know, the doctors talked to us about your knee and stuff. Get the photo done. So there's me. I've got the photo to prove it. I'll post it on your site or something. And there's me <laughs> up the back in the New South Wales. Like, I, I didn't want to be there. Thinking, gee, I'm never going to live this down. And um, after the photo was when that unfolded, they said, look, um, yeah, okay, then if it's as bad as what you're saying, you're ruled out. So they played on the Wednesday. Brian Smith named me in the team on the Friday, I believe it might have been, or Saturday. Name me in the side, and uh, I played. Yeah, what three <laughs> days later, <laughs> but but I, I've still got the um, newspaper, not newspaper. The remember the big league? I don't believe it's even. Yeah, yeah, league. big league. Yeah. In there, there was um, a guy because I wasn't the only person that got ruled out that day. Ian Hindmarsh, Nathan's old, yeah, yeah. old yeah. brother, he got ruled out injured as well, and um, made his debut in the same game as I did. <laughs> so we were both injured. Once I heard about this. I can't play if I'm injured. I, that was that was my out. But it uh, turns out that um, yeah, as I said, the, um, both of us were there. Got ruled out, and yeah, that was that was pretty much it. Made my debut a couple of a couple of days later. And what I remember from the game is I actually set Ian Ironmarsh up for a try. So and a massive human run over the top of me. Um, but Adam, ooh. I'm trying to think of his name, about six foot eight, and uh, yeah, that was the other thing I remember. Played at Newcastle. Oh, um, was it Matt Parsons? Matt Parsons, sorry, not Adam. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was huge, huge man. man. <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, on, he yeah, was obviously yeah. about six foot six, I think, and yep. he was huge. Uh, he ran over the top of me, and the other one was um, threw a dummy, and I think Kurt Gidley. He yep. tried to shoulder barge me and uh, went through Ian Highmarsh back on the inside and give it to him, and he. Scored under the stick, so yeah. But um, Billy Peden broke us in the last ten seconds and scored under the post to to take the game. So, uh, wow! Yeah, a what a funny Billy story. Peden. Yeah, <laughs> still very memorable. But yeah, but uh, look, yeah, that, that that's that whole yeah led up to my debut. The the in, wow. what I was saying. Sorry about that big league. The article in there they um they actually wrote in there how Ian Highmarsh and PJ Marsh from the Parramatta Eels made a miraculous recovery from injury being ruled out. <laughs> and it was in that section where they just sort of got a bit of uh, controversy yeah. or something, you know? Yeah. So there was, it was in there. I've still got the article, which is quite funny, but I've still got the photo, and every now and again I post it up there because around <laughs> origin time and just uh, rub it in, I just say, you know, New South Wales. That's funny. funny. <laughs> Mate, right. um, that season you, you played 12 games for Parramatta, mm-hmm. and all of those games you played at halfback. There's been a lot of stories um, over the years since Peter Sterling retired about the pressure of wearing that famous number seven at Parramatta. Did you experience any of that pressure? Yeah, probably not the pressure. Like, I'm not going to say uh, it, does, it never bothered me that the pressure of uh, having to succeed, I suppose, with that, uh, or even with Sterling, like, none of that really come into the equation. I, was, I just got nervous and stuff because of playing NRL, not because of any of that sort of stuff, yeah. I imagine. Mm. Yeah. So, but look, there's been, yeah, it's always been a, a, a story, uh, you know, had we have won in 01 and had that won a few years later, would they be saying we're still searching after having, you yeah. know, th- th- even those years, 99, 2000, through to about 2003, like they were very successful sides. Um, yeah. Yep. And obviously, there's a halfback in those teams, so you know. So you know, just I suppose they are they judging success by grand final wins, probably, and that's why mm. they see it as no one's ever been there. But you know, Tim Smith, I think it was two thousand and five. Yeah, young fellow, Tim Smith. Yeah, uh, he's still probably the the best halfback I ever played with. He, he oh, wow. was honestly, he was honestly just amazing. Uh, and obviously, he had his issues off the field and things like that, but. 
you go back to that season and we, you know, we lose in a, the major set of the Cowboys. Um, but it was because of him that we were there. Like, you know, he was rookie of the year and all the rest of it that season. And But he was great. So, no, no real pressure for myself at seven. Um, like I said, it was a dream come true for me. I, I was still just sort of finding it hard to believe that I was playing in the NRL. Just as I always tell people, I'm just keeping Blackwater. You know, it's a big man's game, and I was, you know, played small at the time. I think I was weighing about 74 kilograms when I made my debut. So uh, these days, wingers and stuff like that. Yeah, one would probably weigh that. <laughs> nah. <sorry. laughs> Right, we ask we ask all our guests if they remember their first NRL try, and nine times out of ten they do. Do you remember yours? Yeah, hundred percent, I do. Uh, I always said if I um, if I was going to score, I'd do it for me pop. Uh, my pop was one of my biggest fans, and he always said that he'd be at my first game and stuff like that. But he wasn't able to get there. He, you know, he passed away and all the rest of it. But uh, I was against the Roosters. I've got the photo. It made the it actually made the big league or something like that. So. Um, you know, my mum would keep every single clip and stuff like that. And, and obviously being a young fella myself back then, you'd always go to the big league and have a look yeah. to see if you're in there yeah. in some capacity. Because as I said, I still find it, it's fascinating, you know. And I thought it was just like, it was, it was like a dream. You know, you're in magazines, you're playing on TV and things like that. But yeah, scored against the Roosters. I think I only ran about 40 odd metres. Um, <laughs> Then dived over, so yeah, it was pretty special. That was a quarter final too, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, you nailed that quarter final against yeah. the Roosters in two thousand. Yeah. I, yeah. Hey, I already know the go-to guys here. They've tossed up a Parsons. You've, you've got the. Yeah, oh, mate, I, yeah, I don't really remember, but the we, we, remember. we have to be on our toes, mate. We've got to make sure that we've got our info right. <laughs> yeah. Nah, that's good. Yeah. So yeah, definitely remember my first try. The um. Parramatta gained the services of one uh, Jason Taylor for the 2001 season, which moves you to that utility bench uh, position mm. for most of that season. Uh, you still play 22 games, um, 18 of them from the bench. Was it frustrating not to be part of that starting side, considering how good your 2000 season was? Yeah, I, I you know eventually i'll talk about it a bit later but that's eventually sort of what led me to to sort of move on from para um the continue you know they brought in players yep. down the track adam dykes came in and experienced half so i already was put back to being back again so that's when i come to the warriors but look yeah, that 2001 season um yeah on and off you know towards the back end of the year yeah i did did play really good football, but um, yeah, it was that utility role. Brad Drew at that stage, I believe, for mine was one of the best, you know, best players in the yep. in the competition that season. And um, I know he was a bit devastated not to be on the Kangaroo tour. Even um, I remember being down at the the celebrations after the the games and that. But uh, so I'd sub in for him and and Jason Taylor. Sometimes, but he, he was a he was a good minutes player, and he was our goal kicker, and and yeah. obviously people are, you know that would remember him. Uh, he was an amazing goal kicker, so you know it was obviously it was reason to keep, yeah. on, keep him on the field. I know we did have Luke Burt that year, which was also an exceptional goal kicker, but uh, he was definitely on there. And yeah, towards the back end of the year, I suppose you could probably build a case for uh, you know maybe me getting on and being a a starting player. I know in the semi-final versus the Broncos, I, um, as I said, I was still living in dreamland really, and, and dreaming that I'm actually on the big stage. I remember the like yeah. semi-final, you know, where the stadium that holds, you know, was 60 plus thousand and I was looking around thinking this is my playing against the Broncos, which I just, you know, loved as a kid. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, my role was off the bench. I think um, 2001 uh, grand final loss to the Knights. Uh, still probably some of my best football, if not my best football um, in a game uh, I've played ever. Uh, you know, I, um, I come off the bench. I think it was already 20-0. You know, there was nothing I was going to be able to do. 
Um, I, I, w- I, was, I wish I had got on earlier, not to say that I could have done something, but you know, maybe that would have stopped the momentum, just shifting people around a little bit, throw a spanner in the works with Dave Solomona, um, mm-hmm. you know, great player, ex-player, Kiwi. He, um, him and I were coming off the bench and, and we probably were both playing really well all year, but yeah, it wasn't, you know, at the end of the day, I, I was playing my role um, and, and that was my role off the bench at, at that time. How far into the season was it when you signed with the Warriors um, for the next few seasons? And, and how did that offer from the Warriors come about during 2001? Yeah, in 2001, as I said, I, was, I played a lot of games, 22, you know. Um, I was getting paid big money, 42 grand a year, no match payments, um, <laughs> no nothing. Uh, but, you know, um, so what happened is in the back half of the year, as I said, I played a lot of games and I was playing quite well and, and I thought to myself that, um, you know, 2002, uh, 2000, yeah, 2002, uh, you know, I'd probably Jason Taylor was finishing up and we knew that. Um, I just thought to myself that I, I'd be sort of given first shot at the seven and, and, and that's how it'd be. And it wasn't until the end of the season, um, probably only about like just before the finals started, um, and, oh, no, it's got a little bit early. I think we played the Warriors near the end of the season um, and then played them only like three or four weeks later in that in the, the first quarter final and that. But we played them and I remember signing it over there, but there'd been a bit of talk just the week before about Adam Dykes coming in. The talk became that he's just, uh, he's signed and he's coming and he was already an established halfback and I was just like, well, here we go again, you know. <laughs> What's happening here? The, the, showing no faith in us and... So it turned out that um, uh, I ended up, my manager rang me and just said, mate, what are your thoughts on it? And I just said, oh, look, you know, it, it is what it is. And, and he goes, because I'm um, Daniel Anderson, uh, if we take a step back to 99, he was my reserve grade coach. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. You know, and we won the grand final in 99. Yep. Um, reserve grade premiers. Um, we had a great side. And so Daniel Anderson was obviously at the Warriors at the time. And... He was talking to my manager and just said, mate, what's PJ doing? And uh, it was literally done within a, probably a week, the contract. I, I remember them just saying, you want to come over? I said, yeah. And he said, look, 5'8", yep, yeah, all good. I was going to be playing 5'8". And and that was um, exciting for me because I, I, well, I just wanted to be on the field uh, as yeah. a starter, really, yeah. slash be in this team. So that was uh, important to me. And... Yeah, it's a little bit scary, I suppose, going to New Zealand. And I'd only just met um, my wife, and, you know, back then, girlfriend, uh, and and she was uh, quite young. She just turned seventeen, and I was young myself. And it, you know, to move to New Zealand was going to be pretty, pretty full on. But made the decision, and um, yeah, it was all signed off before the finals had even started. I think it was the week of the finals it sort of just got announced because there was a cut off date normally. So they, yeah. you know, had to do it all in a day, apparently, in a day. <laughs> but, yeah. Just yeah, a couple and then of years. Yeah, obviously left that after that grand final and stuff there. Just uh, your mum's commented saying she's got every clipping of uh, every newspaper you've ever been in. She's commented on the comments here, mate. Yeah, right, eh? No, that'd be true, yeah. <laughs> That um, when you're saying that you <laughs> that 2001 season, you're on uh, 42 grand, you know, living mm-hmm. the dream. Do you shake your head now at the amount of money that, Throwing around in on uh, contracts in rugby league, yeah, it, it is. I, I talk to mates and they laugh because some of them are sort of my era that have played in the you know the high level and stuff, and some that yeah. aren't but understand footy. And they're like, mate, you were too young for Super League, and you were just uh, on your way out when they started getting paid some serious money. And I just said, oh well, that's the way it is. But yeah, forty two grand. Uh, look, uh, a lot. <laughs> As much as I think about it now, the amount of money that, you know, a state of origin hooker would be yeah. on, yeah. I couldn't imagine any a state of origin hooker being on sort of under about six or 700,000 a year. Yeah. I would have liked to have, I would have liked to have earned that in my career. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, that, um, that 42 yeah. grand is what they get paid for the one game playing origin too, isn't it? I believe it's about forty thousand dollars now. Yeah. I thought you just went there and played because you oh, you just man. got picked in the side. <laughs> mate, um, I um, yeah. 
I remember my first contract I signed it was five hundred bucks, and I think out of that I got two hundred and ten dollars from it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, mate, that that two thousand one season with Parramatta, that you you guys were virtually unbeatable. Um, grand final aside, what do you remember about that season? Because I think he's only lost three or four games in the regular season that year. Yeah, it's about yeah, only about four games, I believe. Uh, look, it was just a great side. We had we had a lot of like looking back on it now, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like we had a full team of superstars or anything like that. But we just come together, and as I said, players like Brad Drew, like just the way he played, um, Jason Taylor, you know, his goal kicking, he was on fire. Uh, Brett Hodgson, I think it was, yeah, Brett Hodgson. Mm. Yeah, fall back. You know, that's like probably the only person that was ever smaller than me and lighter. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> but he, um, he was there and he had just an outstanding season. And obviously Nathan Highmarsh and Nathan Kalis. Um, there was lots of players in there that just we just they just did their job. And the season, what I remember is just winning games like, and winning well. Like you know that semi, the first semi versus the Warriors just. It was like a training run. It, it really mm-hmm. was. Uh, yeah, and, and we played. Held us up. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and it was. It become like, you know, some players in there, like Jamie Lyons. Like, I, I think he may have only been, well, he, he's younger than me. So, look, he may, yeah. he would have only been 18 or 19 years old that year, and he was probably one of the best centres in the game yeah. at, yep. at that time. And, it, and, he, and it was only his second season, I think, so. Yeah, we had lots of players there doing their thing. Luke Burke, obviously, just a solid footballer. But, yeah, lots of good. So I just remember winning. That's probably the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, qualifying for your first NRL grand final, can you describe the emotions of that grand final week leading into the game in 2001? Yeah. It, it's hard to sort of remember a lot of it. Uh, I was young and I just... I just thought to myself, well, just, you know, this is what happens. You, you come into the thing, you, you play some good football and, and you go through you took grand finals or at least the qualifying finals. And, yeah, it probably wasn't um, – and uh, I probably wasn't really – you know, I was a bit naive to it all, really. I, I just thought it was quite easy. You know, I'd come in, 99, we win the grand final and barely lose a game in reserve grade. 2000, we played quite well um, in – in reserve uh, reserve grade, they they I think made the grand final again. Might have lost the final, uh, and then in and so we were just oh, I was I suppose yeah, just lots um, yeah, lots 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 of things there with that side and that um, yeah, but he the lost young... bad boys. What are we, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to over here. No, you're What's right. That? Yeah. What's what that? was it? What was yeah? I was just oh, going to ask. Grand final I, I was, week. Yeah. The emotions of grand final week. Oh yeah, yeah. As I said, I was probably naive to it. All. I thought it was just a regular thing. And grand final week, was, you know, I had every one of my friends ringing me up. Just you know, they couldn't yeah. believe it. You know, just kid. Yeah, well, that as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another thing. As I said, I got a billion relatives. So yeah, I, uh, yeah. It all went pretty quickly. You know. Gee whiz, we, um, yeah, we just sort of that year was expected just to go through and grand final dinner and stuff. I was just young, just thinking that all this is all normal. I'll get to do this a few times maybe in my career. Yeah. <laughs> but, Wait, yeah, it, it, was, it was big. I was just excited. You know, that was the emotions I had. I was just excited thinking, how good is this? The um, That grand final itself, you mentioned it a little bit before, didn't go as expected. Uh, Newcastle ambushed you guys. I think the first half was 24 nil at half time, yeah. uh, and you, you, you did fight back. Uh, the final score was 30 to 24. But what are your actual memories of that that game uh, in and the aftermath, knowing that that was the last game you were going to play for the Parramatta Eels at that time? Yeah, it, it was probably going to be difficult. It had we have won the game to leave, probably would have made it a little bit harder. Uh, you know, you always want to stay at clubs that are successful. And although the Warriors were doing okay, they still were no, no Parramatta Reels at that stage. They've been successful. But, um, yeah, I suppose I remember the most is running out and just hearing the noise 
the noise of the, the, the crowd at that stage, it was still, uh, as a, I think they were still fitting nearly 80,000 people in there at that stage yeah. because they still had, I remember they reduced it a bit, but it was just, it was the most amazing thing running out there. As I said, I'm just a kid from Blackwater that's, you know, a couple of thousand people and then just in Rockhampton and then, you know, only short three years later, I'm in Sydney playing, you know, three three years beforehand, I was just playing for Rockhampton Brothers, you know, and then here I am playing in an NRL grand final. So I do remember standing there for the national anthem and all the rest of it and just, like, just did the look around. Couldn't believe Soaking it. Soaking it up. Yeah. It was mm. just the most amazing thing ever. Um, you know, it's... it's went south pretty quickly, that amazing thing. <laughs> when, <laughs> when we got scored on, scored on, scored on. Uh, and I'm still just sitting on the bench thinking, what am we going to do here? Uh, do I just give up now? Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was just, I just want to ask about Brian Smith. Um, what, how did you find him as a coach? And uh, uh, we had Tukes on um, last year, and he was talking about you know Brian Smith obviously being a very good, successful coach, but he, he liked to play like mind games with his players. I remember there was something that came out about him sending you guys weird texts or something before the grand final. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, like I, th- I don't know if I was just young and didn't care, but I don't remember texts or something. But, <laughs> but uh, look, Brian Smith for me is probably the, the smartest coach. Uh, that's ever been around. Obviously, people gauge stuff again on winning premierships and they say he couldn't win them and stuff. But uh, see, I sit on the fence, the, the other side of it, I suppose, because, you know, suppliers, you know, coaches, they can still only do so much. Um, you know, whether or not it had anything to do with him or not, I don't believe so. But Brian Smith, my time under him, look, I, I, I loved it. Uh, as I said, I think he's the smartest coach. He, he, he knows he was always ahead of things, you know, all the tracking stuff and things like that, and and just lots of little things that are just a part of everyday stuff now. He was really much all over that and wanted and was always pushing for things like that, rehab and stuff. He would always have, you know, he got teams together of rehab people and and you know it was a, just really smart and 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 how the club was just, it was a successful time, you know, and, and I believe it a, a lot to do with him. But I, I, mean, look, I enjoyed my time under Smithy. Yeah. I just remember when you're talking about him being innovative because Tukes was saying that he was one of the first ones to get those really tight fitting jerseys and, and Tukes was saying that was a nightmare for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we know why with Tukes, but uh, yeah, at the time I didn't mind actually, because, you know, I was a fit, but uh, Look, he was. I remember them turning up and he got about three different ones trialled and he gave them to people at training, just said, what do you think? And you'd feel it and mm. the grip on it and stuff like that. And uh, as a, The tight jersey thing, he was talking about, the, you know, getting the, the little edges, the little one percenters, you yeah. get dra- grabbed by the jersey and things like that. And he, he had them tapered in, uh, the actual jerseys, I don't believe, because we were still wearing a bit of materials that year, I believe. Mm. And it, um, so they uh, they would get them tapered in and things like that. Which yeah, he is, mate. He, he was ahead of his time, and uh, and I believe it, it still now. Like he's re- just could sort of bring the best out and, and see footballers and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, two thousand and two, you arrive at the Warriors, and although you've only played thirty four games, you arrive on the back of two very successful seasons at the Eels and a seventy eight percent win ratio in your games played. How was it relocating, not just to a new club, but to a new country? And what were your first impressions of the club, the Warriors? Yeah, well, I'd been upgraded from the 42,000, so... <laughs> nice. <laughs> I loved them. I loved them. <laughs> at that stage, yeah, it was, it was nervous arriving at the Warriors. Uh, obviously, moving country, that's... It wasn't as though I was just heading up to sort of from Parrot or Penrith or to Newcastle. No. Moving to and, and moving with my uh, girlfriend at the time of only sort of about six months and it was just pretty full on, you know, I was pretty scared. Uh, when we got there, uh, I think, uh, I'm trying to think, the air, yeah, it was at the airport. We I had about $300 to my name. 
and I got to the airport and I bought a wooden drum, had it smoked or clean <laughs> or something. Uh, so they took a hundred off me. <laughs> so I was hating on the place already uh, because I had two hundred. Because I had two hundred, I was down to two hundred. And, and I'm not even lying. You know, some people say they're down to their last five bucks and stuff like that. I did. I only had three hundred dollars. Uh, so I got there. They took a hundred off me. Only had two hundred left and got picked up from the airport. All the rest of it. And um, my first impressions, I lived with Tooks for about the first month I was there and was uh, I even borrowed a bit of money off him because uh, we got paid monthly and yeah it was probably another three or four weeks until I was getting my first pay. Yeah. <laughs> so we lived with Tooks and he looked after me for the first sort of three or four months until we uh, found a place, found our feet but first impressions the Warriors were just a, a really uh, up and coming place to be. Daniel Anderson was uh, obviously under Brian Smith and had all the same sort of ways of trying to better the club and all the rest of it. And, and he'd already proved that in 2001, uh, you know, first time in the finals, all the rest of it. So he was he was awesome uh, doing that. So first impressions were, you know, I'm just excited. And, and I sort of went there as a bit of a sort of a big signing, which was weird. Like you said, I'd only played, a, you know, 30 odd games and, so went was and New Zealand being sort of sort of tight knit and stuff, uh, you you you're made to feel pretty pretty big time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to the work, right? You know, you're walking around and people, everybody knows you. Yeah, uh, yeah, around Auckland, I suppose if you head to the south and stuff like that, but rugby union they wouldn't even know. But yeah, you start to get to you know. So my first impressions were just gonna you know, up and come up and. And I'm going to get the start. That's a big one. I was happy about too. <laughs> Living with um, Tooks, that would have been interesting, mate. You would have had to fought to get some food. And then um, <laughs> going to training in that red mini. Would you go on to training with him in the red mini that he had? Mate, I, I believe, it, yeah, it was before he even got it fixed up. He, he got it all spruced up by a sponsor. I think he sucked up <laughs> with someone over there and was trying to get it all sorted. But uh, he got little mags and everything. But, no, we used to drive around in it. Uh, yeah. It was, it was interesting. I didn't have to exactly fight him for food, but uh, I remember that it was probably about the maybe about the fourth day I was there, and he came home and he's got KFC and he puts it on the table, and I'm just loving. It. I love KFC, and he's just like, and he's telling me, and I, like I said, I was pretty young, naive, but I'm just, I don't know. I used to just believe people. It's like when Tukes interview, he rang up and made a bloody phone call saying that the local newspaper want to interview me before the 99 grand final and Tukes is in the car park at McDonald's telling me that that's where the news people wanted to meet me and <laughs> turns out it was Tukes just playing jokes on me so, <laughs> you know, it, um, it was uh, yeah interesting I didn't exactly find it but with the KFC so he's rocked up there with it and he says to me this person I was driving out of the car park at the shopping centre at Pakaranga and he goes, and this person just threw it through my window. And I said, you brought it home and we're eating it. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I just thought he was for real. And then he goes, and I said, just threw it in the window and you want me to eat it. I said, mate, they couldn't have anything with it. And he was talking, obviously, about the drive-thru. Yeah. To him. And I just went, oh, far, okay, you got me. But, yeah, so, no, he was always good. He'd, he'd shout me. So that was, was good. He's a good man, Tukes. We love yeah, him. Very he is, good man. He is. Yeah. Um, mate, you make your club debut uh, round two, um, 2002, against the Roosters at Mount Smart Stadium. What are your memories of that first home game playing in front of the Mount Smart faithful? Well, we ran from the out from the tunnel uh, that day, I believe. I, 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 um, you probably remember, did we? You probably, yeah. yeah. I thought yeah. so. Yeah, and, we used to, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Nah, and that was pretty amazing. Echoes in the cliffs yeah. on the ground. You know, obviously still some people back then had some metal ones and even the normal ones, it just on the cement running through that or the ground, they had a bit of cover. They made a noise and it echoed. And gee whiz, and they just, the crowd was, you know, first game, it was pretty, you know, home. It was pretty packed. Uh, yeah, I remember after about being at the Warriors for about three weeks, rolling my ankle and being 
ruled out for nearly, you know, however long and wasn't going to play. Yeah. Uh, I remember just sort of battling back from that and in the warm-up, I strained my quad and I've got to got strap it on the leg and so I remember those things in the warm-up. I remember running through the tunnel and and just, as I said, just the, the roar from the crowd. I don't know, I'm not sure whether they're just louder, but it was just something different, you know, coming out from the tunnel and that we're one town, one team and it's just yeah. support that we had there was just amazing i'm trying to, i don't even remember whether we won yeah we won uh, well we, we yeah 20 21 14 i think it was you, you yeah, kicked I, the field goal i think yeah it probably wasn't the win or anything was it no, <laughs> no I was, probably the layer up at the end of the game or something but yeah look i remember you, playing against eric growth i remember eric growth turning up there he was uh he just gone to the roosters i believe hmm. and um catching up with him saying g'day and as, as i said i lived with him for a little while when we were young fellas but yeah pretty special that that, that game for the warriors it was good yeah. good fun you play your first two games in the halves but before a se- and then a season ending injury to monty beatham sees you move to hooker were you happy to change to that position uh Daniel Anderson, after talking to him all about how I wanted to play 5-8 and that much of it, uh, when Monty went down his playing hooker and I went to him at training because he said he didn't have anyone, he said, I, um, I said, I'm happy to play hooker. Can I play hooker? And he just goes, really? Really? You want to? And he got excited about it. <laughs> and in my head, I'm thinking, look, I, I love that sort of bench hooker role, a lot of power that I was doing. And... And, you know, and I was pretty quick out of dummy half. I, I played a lot of touch as a kid. Played, you know, in the Australian 20s teams. And a lot of touch football, as people would know, is you're scooping the ball up from dummy half and running fast. And yep. things like that. So, look, I was happy to. Yeah, when Monty went down, it was obviously devastating for himself. And, you know, but I'm sure Lance Ohio, he'd um, say elsewise. He, otherwise, he was really happy because but he was only a young kid. And he came straight into 5'8". Um, in the starting side, and I remember talking to him halfway through the season. He was telling me about how he's on match payments just to play <laughs> because he wasn't <laughs> expected to play at all, really. Yeah. Uh, and he'd come in and played nearly every game <laughs> and yeah. was outstanding. You yeah, know? it was. And talking about all the money he's getting for match payments. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the move, look, I was happy about it. I really was. I, I, I asked to go there, and as you know, probably, and that was the last time I ever, you know, didn't really play. Um, at, at hooker yeah yeah well you form so good at hooker um you get selected for queensland in the origin series for origin two and three uh replacing your warriors teammate kevin campion uh in that squad mate that must have been a huge personal moment for you uh to be selected to play for queensland after having been selected to play for new south wales all those years <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I was, well that was long gone out of my memory it didn't come up a funny story that I tell all my mates and stuff. <laughs> That's all that was by then, but it's it's hard to describe that one. It, that's really surreal. Like even now, sitting back, just thinking, you know, I played State of Origin, yeah. and because uh, I never forget where I come from, and and as I said, I'm just from a little country town, CQ, and it's the now all of a sudden, yeah, I went to Sydney, then you know played the grand final, you know, then moved to country and then you know only so many games later and here i am playing for queensland and it was just probably when i got told and rang up it was it really was just like i'm just i couldn't believe it, it was amazing uh I, now that i think about it i think um i think it might have been uh Daniel Mann, paul Duncan at the club at the time uh that might have been come down and told me actually then i got a phone call but yeah something special I'll never ever forget running out there. I, I the week at training was just the most amazing thing I've ever experienced. I was playing with both two of my childhood heroes, Robbie O'Davis and Alan Langer, and I and here I am passing the ball to Alan Langer, mm-hmm. you know, kicking the ball to Robbie O'Davis, just mucking around at training in a state of origin with my childhood heroes. Like, who gets to do that stuff? And <laughs> You know, it was just so memorable, you know? Yeah. Did you find uh, Origin, like, such a different pace 
uh, to the game, like so many have spoken about over the years? Yeah, it, it certainly was. And uh, look, it was just, it, it was crazy because, you know, you're thinking, I'm going to run harder. And then the tacklers are thinking, I'm going to tackle harder today. I'm going to do this. So therefore, the whole game just goes up. And, and then on saying that, you've always got the best players. So therefore, the standard's going to probably even be a little bit higher, even without all of that stuff going on in everyone's mind because i remember robbie o davis he didn't get called straight into the side and and rob had messaged me and just uh he'd get all these messages from people and he said look just uh just take it easy uh in the first bit you just gotta you know calm yourself down you'll try and make every tackle you'll try and make every run and you just gotta calm it all down and i think i made the first four and nearly had to walk all the way back on side. <laughs> Thanks for the advice. I'm glad I listened to Robbie. Um, you know what I think about it? He might have come in for game two, actually, Robbie did, but he'd messed with me for game one. Um, yeah, but uh, hilarious, mate. You know, so, yeah, I listened well. <laughs> but after playing Origin, though, did you, did you find that you returned to club football with a newfound confidence and self-belief? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know... I went back to club, not with an arrogance, but with a, I'm a state of origin player. And I took that with me uh, in a confident, in a confident and um, respectful way, but I took it back with me and, and just because I, I was around some of the best and I saw how they even did extras after training and, and things like that. And, and here I am, you know, thinking I'm putting the effort in. I could probably just do a little bit more because I've seen that. But I went back to club football and and just really uh, went to another level, I think, with my club football. Uh, I just got a lot of confidence. You know, started kicking out of dummy half all the time and, and was doing really well, you know, kicking. And um, just everything sort of went went really positively. I, I know after the game, we stayed. Uh, I played Origin, but then the Warriors were coming over to play the Broncos a few days later. And Daniel Anderson said, just stay there. Uh, so I stayed there and um, I remember uh, we played the, the game after that, the Broncos, and we, and we beat them there. And it was the famous Sione Famawina. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that Very was pretty good. Cool. And I scored yeah. a nice try in that one. And, and that was against a lot of my Queensland uh, teammates. And obviously, you know, Wayne was there. From, so, yeah, it was... Um, yeah, it was it was good coming back. And, and, and I think, yeah, I did gain a lot of confidence from it. Your mum said it's the proudest. Uh, as a mum, it was the proudest moment when he rung us to tell us he was going to play in the state of origin. It was such a buzz. I can imagine it would have been. Um, mate, yeah, as you said, the Warriors go on a bit of a run that season too, winning eight in a row, which is club record today. Um, and you actually won 12 from 14, I think, to finish off the season. What are your memories of that period of the season? Like, must have been exciting. You were probably so used to winning anyway, coming from those, uh, those two seasons, Parramatta probably second nature to you yeah exactly right as i said it wasn't so much second nature yeah but it, it was it was just like well you know we're winning games it, it there wasn't too many lulls in in my career at that stage after three years and things were just looking you know really really good but um yeah mem memories from the, the season uh look I, I, i'll tell you one big one for a lot of us we're on match payments so win, lose, and draw. <laughs> so, so, look, that's one big thing that I remember. I remember getting paid. Um, <laughs> you know, as I said, I loved, play, I loved playing football. So yeah. that was just like a, a, another massive bonus. I probably would have played for nothing. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, look, that's a memory. And, yeah, as you said, again, uh, yeah, I was pushing the power that, that memories, of, we were winning. It was just so successful, you know, um, throughout that season, as I said, the origin and, you know, coming back, getting the confidence and all the rest of it. It's just, um, yeah, winning games was good, you know, won the first origin I played in two. That's, you know, everything was just going really well. Yeah. Um, do you remember your first try in Warriors colours? Maybe your first try in first grade, but first Warriors try. I'm going to say no. I haven't, I've, I think I've only ever seen maybe one, one or two of them. Can't find them. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. sometimes they get, 
things get posted, but I've only ever seen two of them. One was against Parramatta, and uh, I'm trying to think. One might have been against the Rabbitohs. Yeah, so. against against the Cowboys, round 13, 2002. Uh, it's the week after Origin, and you were wearing jersey number 21. Well, wow. yeah, okay. I might have, yeah, might have, might have been doing the dummy run. Wasn't playing and coming late, you reckon? <laughs> Mate, where was it? Was it at home? Um, at home, or was it? Yeah, it was at Mount Smart. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. No, I don't remember that one, but. Yeah. Obviously, Maybe. obviously, wearing jersey twenty-one, you're probably because it was a week after Origin two, um, so you're probably named on the bench. Maybe not going to play, but then Daniel Essen chucked you in at the last minute to start. He started the game. He didn't come off the bench. So yeah, yeah. look, I have no doubt I would have been telling Ando I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, sometimes sometimes coaches can see when players are maybe getting a little bit older or they're even starting to get a little bit they're a bit fatigued maybe from the season uh mid-season might need to just n not double up or they might even have a little injury so that's yep. possible why but um yeah i have no doubt i would have been kicking and screaming to play the game <laughs> that um that 2002 season's pretty synonymous with um the bulldog salary cap breach stuff uh you know they were they went on a massive run that won 15 in a row until they met us in i think it was round 20 where we we beat them uh, then not long after that, they, they lost their points. Um, we finish up minor premiers, first time in the club's history, and we have our first ever home semi final against the Canberra Raiders, winning 36 20. What yeah. do you remember about that momentous occasion in the club's history, uh, that, that semi final at home? Yeah, the home semi final versus the Raiders, I just remember the whole, I just remember the whole entire sort of country almost was just they were just it was warriors and, and by then we and myself obviously had been around for a while now in town and just everywhere you went you'd get noticed and stuff like that and and i just remember the same deal you know the crowds they never stopped getting to me it was it, it's to hear a roar of a crowd and to think that it's because of you blokes so the, you know the guy that you's out on the field is yeah. it's it's pretty full on uh and as I said, they're loud, uh, and the stadium's quite uh, in close. It's one of those stadiums that's pretty good, to, you know, one of the better ones to play at, I thought. And uh, uh, yeah, I just remember, as I said, it was another successful year. Canberra come there, I, we didn't expect to lose to them at all. I, I just, we just went out on the field thinking, you know, we'll do what we've got to do today, and, um, and we'll be right. Yeah. Yeah, the club was also presented the JJ Giltman Shield after that game, and yourself being part of a minor premiership winning team two years in a row must have been pretty rewarding. Rewarding. Yeah, as I said, it's always good to win. You know, I've never met anyone. You know, I have jokes <laughs> with my kids about the whole when people yell. You know, it's a whole other story, but people say you know to their kids and stuff. So long as you have fun, like you know, I'm pretty ruthless when it comes to stuff like that. It's like yeah, you know. He's obviously having fun because he's playing something he wants to play and he's asked you to play football. So yeah. maybe let's move to the next thing, mate, win. Because yeah. I've never had fun losing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, two years in a row, there we were there. But, um, oh. You've kind of got that... Um... You've kind of got that James Maloney aura of you, mate. You know, he's always called Jimmy Wins. You're like PJ Wins because, mate, back then everything you touched turned to gold, nearly, didn't it? Yeah, look, we were, as I said, we were going really well. Uh, yeah. You know, I remember coming back after two years out of the game and uh, and we were successful again in 2005, went through to the major semi again. Um, yeah, oh, it's great being a part of successful teams, you know, and yeah. and even to, the, to date, you know, because, and I have no doubt that it's contributed, but the success of the Warriors in 2002, um, that's why, for me, I'm a Warriors man. Um, you know, I played only nearly what forty odd games or something like that. But but I consider myself just I'm a Warriors player, you know, and it's I support the Warriors now, and that's my team I support. And, awesome. Um, oh, yeah. Safe. So you know, it's good to be a part of successful teams. You know. Yeah. yeah. Mate, that um the grand final qualifier two thousand two against the Sharkies, uh, one of the most iconic games in the club's history. I remember being there for that. 
Um, we've had big tooks. We've had uh, Justin Murphy, Clinton Torpy, and Campo all come on and share their memories of that game. Tell us what you remember about the game and the feelings you had heading into your second consecutive grand final. Ah, uh, look, the Johnny Carlo. Yeah, Johnny Carlo, yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, they done. Stacey Jones have been doing that all year. This the cross kicks and the kicks and things and and uh, look, I just remember. Uh, I think one of the boys running running Peachy down was it? Was it Justin Murphy? Yeah, was it? Yeah, Justin Murphy? yeah, I think it yeah. was. Yeah. You know, yeah. Dave Peachy runs away from almost every other player yeah. in the competition, and and Justin Murphy. You know, I think I think the, the game changes, and and that was, you know, just a big thing. But oh, look, the biggest thing I remember is Kevin Campy and uh, headbutting Dean Treister. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you've seen the photo of Campo's cut on his head. You know, yeah, yeah. And you know, there's, there's been over the internet as well where it's, they've shown it still when it just fresh happened and it's just mess everywhere. He had, he, I swear, his paper thin skin had just split. <laughs> Campo, yeah. And, uh, I remember him doing it because I was at Hooker at the time and Campo, and I've gone to pack in and Campo has just grabbed me by the back of the neck and just gone, get to F and lock. You know, with his teeth. <laughs> oh, what are you doing? He goes, just do as you're being told. And I went back to lock. And as they packed down in the scrum, I just heard this bang. bang. And I just went, whoa. And then the scrum broke up and Dean Treaster was just laying on the ground, just out cold. And Campo's come out just with blood all over him. And the referee at the time is just going, come here. And he's just going, and Kemba goes, oh, we just, um, we just come down at the same time and accidentally, <laughs> accidentally just butted heads. And I'm thinking, yeah. It's all, it's all it is. All it is. <laughs> oh, Kemba cracked him good. And I remember after the game on the, and it might have been on the plane or it might have been the first day back in New Zealand. I remember um, talking to Kemba and I said, what, what's the go with Dean Treese? You just, you had it in for him the whole game. He goes, oh, I just didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I remember the headbutt from Campo and the John Carlo try, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's such an awesome game. One of the greatest yeah. games in our biggest game in our history at the time. Yeah. Um, Back crowd, they bought the, the yeah. ticket for all those Aussies, at, um, Kiwis that were in Aussie at the time. Mm. So. It was great, mate. We All we had to do was turn up with our uh, passport and we'd get four free tickets to the game. It was awesome. Yeah, Mad Butcher and the team. Well yeah. done. And they Derek did it Watson. the second year, too. They did it in um, in O three for the um, when we played Penrith in the yeah. grand final. Oh yeah, but um, yeah, great, great, great memories. And in regards yeah. to Campo, I don't think there's many pitches on in, on the internet of Campo without blood on it. <laughs> very hard to find. Yeah. Very hard to find one. <laughs> He's bloody legend, Campo. I remember that season was when he um, clipped uh, Shane Webke. Shane Webke, the, yeah. the famous photo where Campo yeah. like this. And, Yep. You know, name was just about to eat his fist. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't worry, first origin, there's a quick story for first origin when I turned up and Shane Webke goes, Yeah, yeah, you grub and I'm thinking, What do I do? <laughs> like I was thinking, what's happening? And uh, if you have a close look, everyone always says it's a dog, but I was behind holding Webke and as That's Webke right. was swing one off just holding his arm and he couldn't <laughs> throw it. And, and I always tell tell him he, he's lucky. That uh, he got knocked out after one camp. I was about to lay a few more on him. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I remember. I remember Campo saying that. Yeah. 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 Could hit. He could hit that yeah. man. Yeah. Grand Grand Final week with the Warriors though would have been somewhat different to what it was a previous year with Para. I mean, obviously with the overseas travel, but the as you touched on before, the the support of the entire nation. Um, yeah. Tell us your memories of that grand final week, the build up to the big game in two thousand and two. Well, the biggest thing, the biggest thing for us was probably when we come back into the airport, into the country, like realizing that we're going to be in a grand final. There, were, there was thousands of people, like thousands, at the airport. It was, um, it was pretty crazy. Uh, so, you know, you make the grand final the year before with Parramatta. You know, we hop on the bus and we. We drove back to Paralese, yeah, probably, yeah. you know, probably a couple of hundred people. That was, that was still it was still a big deal, but um, yeah, it was it was very different. Walking in the airport, I just remember it was just it erupted. 
and you couldn't even hear yourself talking. It was everyone was there. It was amazing. So it what, was very different, and, and obviously the whole week being not in, you know, the country for the first few days, but then we yeah. sort of go over a little bit early because of the grand final breakfast and all of the rest of it. Um, there was a lot of differences in that regard, but um, just yeah, just something special again. You know, it was coming through that airport. I still remember that. That was pretty special, and just uh, people, a lot of people out training for the week as well whether it be the first few sessions in New Zealand, yep. the ones over there, there was reporters everywhere just wanting to sort of document the whole thing. Um, so, yeah, it's a little bit different, I suppose. You know, you win the final over there and then you just sort of jet back off to New Zealand. That was that was yeah. pretty full on. Yeah. Um, what about the game itself? What do you what do you remember about the actual game the, of the, the 2002 grand final? Uh, look, I obviously remember Stacey scoring that try, uh, and and you could see uh, as we were sort of going after him as well. You know, as he's gone through, the big screen was right behind it, um, the the field, so you could see Stacey just go up and and yeah, I just remember that being something special. Like Stacey had a special season that year. It was yeah, it it was not just good. It was obviously he was a golden boot uh, winner, but. That that I remember. Um, other than that, it goes. It's pretty quick. I was still, like I said, still very young, and it just sort of flew by before I knew it. You know, yeah. And it's just a shame that it got away on us at, at the end. But uh, it's still something special to play in a grand final. I don't, you know, I used to look at all the things I'd lost when I finished football. I'd lost, you know, uh, football had been taken from me. I, you know, you think to yourself, I lost grand finals. Um, you know, you talk to every young kid that wants to play in the NRL, if they, you know, to play in a grand final, win, lose, or draw, you know, it's going to be special. And and I suppose, I look back at that, and, um, yeah. So. It, was, it was a weird game too, because, well, not a weird game, but you look at the scoreline, it finished up 30 to 8, but yeah. for up, it was only 8... Eight six, still with twenty minutes to go. You know, they they just got all their points in the in the last twenty minutes. Um, when we had Camper on, he confirmed the story about a weird tape being played at halftime and uh, him destroying it. Do you remember that incident? <laughs> There's another thing I probably don't pay attention enough. I don't remember. It. I don't remember. Apparently, I don't remember too much. It was like a country of the playing the Broncos in the grand final. Yeah, beating they, the Broncos, yeah. It, it, Alan, yeah. Alan Mack or someone did it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, and, um, so, so, yeah. And then yeah, Campo, yeah. Was, <laughs> Campo like, watch this fucking shit. And... <laughs> 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 I could just imagine Campo doing that too. Uh, yeah, I, I, I swear I've had too many knocks in the head, eh, because oh, I don't remember it at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't remember it. Another another famous moment from the the two thousand and two grand final was obviously the the Richard Villasanti hit on um, Freddie Fittler. So when we had Big Tooks on last year, he told us it was actually uh, Wairangi Corpu's elbow and not Richard Villasanti's head that opened up Freddie Fittler. Um, that moment, obviously, a real game changer. Uh, obviously, had a huge impact in that game. Do you remember what went down there? <laughs> No, nah, not really. Uh, I have seen the footage about uh, Villa doing that, and I still can't really understand why people are saying it was because of him and uh, that was a game changer. I'm not sure. I know that there was a 40-20. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was kicked not long after, and, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Hey, was that one? I think, they, I think it was, they just got all the momentum after that because they got a penalty and they kind of yeah. touched themselves upfield yeah. and... And they scored off that set, and then yeah, they kind of just controlled the game for the next twenty minutes. You really didn't get any more chances in that game, and I think that's why it goes down as one of those biggest game changes in a grand final. Because because it fired them up, and then there was the Morley yeah. hit as well back on Villa. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'd have to watch the game. <laughs> don't watch it. Don't you don't want to watch it again. <laughs> got the memories. 
Because oh, yeah, mate, every, time, every time you watch it, it ends the same way. Yeah, I know. I, I watch it up to Stacey's try, and then that's it. Yeah. I, I, I watch it till we're up eight six, and I go, I just like to think that that's how it ended. <laughs> also, before I forget, sorry, sorry, mate. Before I forget, you guys were the only ones to actually hear Billy Idol perform. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember at the halftime? Was it the pregame entertainment? Billy Idol was supposed to come out. Yeah. Yeah, but um, he, he, there was no power. There was a power outage at the game or something, so no one actually even heard him perform. But you blokes apparently in your captain's run um, were ah, yeah, on the so turf good. while Billy Idol was playing, and apparently uh, Henry Farfilly and someone else got up on stage with him. Yeah, yeah. Now that you're, now that you're, I thought you were going to say to me that we heard him on the night somehow because no. yeah, I was like, no, you heard his warm up. You heard yeah, him warming yeah. up. Yeah, his, his yeah. Um, pre. <laughs> no, nah, yeah. yeah, he was there, yeah, up there. Uh, yeah, and Henry, he was always a bit of a showman. And, and <laughs> yeah, they. Uh, I, I do remember that. That was pretty. Like I said, even that was pretty sort of daunting. You're talking about grand final week. Uh, you know, heading out onto the stadium. You know, and they've got. They've just started doing all the spray painting and Billy Idol, mm. like Billy Idol's there and singing and all the rest of it. You start getting that bit of a nervous yeah. energy. In your well, you know, yeah, so, but no, we, well, we did hear him a bit, yeah, <laughs> Mate, a bit um, of white wedding rebel yell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, one more little anecdote from Campo. Um, when he was on, he he told us a story about Nat Wood and a certain scream mask prank that he used to play on everyone. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever fall to that prank? No, nah, I didn't because Natty was there the year of, before I come, but gee whiz. I heard some stories about <laughs> the, the whole back and forward scaring each other. It, it started getting out of hand in the end. I think Campo was saying something about he broke into Natty's house and then waited for him. Yeah. <laughs> and Gee, and jumps, just... out, jumps out the cupboard, you know, so full on. Yeah. <laughs> Natty, Good, Natty ju- broke into um, Ivan Cleary's house. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Campo was in the street watching and... Uh, yeah, when he was doing his little thing, it was young Nathan, uh, you know, five, four, five-year-old Nathan. That came Scared in the room. life out of him. <laughs> All right, see, there you go. No, but I didn't follow that campo. See, I don't know whether half of campo's stories are exaggerated, I reckon. <laughs> oh, they... <laughs> I don't, don't, don't say, yeah, hopefully he's not listening because... Oh, he watches. He watches. But, yeah, he'll, uh, up, he watches. Yeah. He'll, he'll find you. He'll find you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, he's a legend. Um, yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, he's a top bloke. Um, the 2003 season, so the club is in great shape, obviously, after uh, we start the season quite well. Um, six wins and three losses in the opening nine games in 2003. And you take on the added responsibility with some goal kicking. Were you a goal kicker as a junior? Nah, not at all. <laughs> You know, I was just a kid, loved footy, and I, like I said, I just wanted to do everything. So I'm like, yep, 100%, I'm a kicker, all right? You know, mate, I wasn't really. I did a bit of kicking for the reserve grade Parramatta side uh, in 99, that year we won it, but I, I really I really wasn't and probably wasn't disciplined enough to go and put extra training in to do it, but I put my hand up because I thought it was another way of sort of big a bit, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't real successful, I tell you, in 2003 kicking. Yeah. No, I, I no, I didn't. I, I looked at the results, and I I wasn't going to put your kicking percentage up, mate, because it's, it's it's not good. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I missed some. I missed some real easy ones. I do remember. Yeah, yeah. None as easy, yeah, none as easy as Laurie Daly did. I'm sure. <laughs> mate, um, round fourteen, two thousand three, uh, game against your old club Parramatta. You suffer a neck injury. Um, which ends your season, and at the time, people thought your career. Can you tell us a little bit about that time in that period in your life? Uh, you know how, how the how the injury happened, and and basically what you had to go through for the next eighteen months, I guess. Yeah, it's it's tough. I, I do. I talk. I've talked about it a few times, um, and it even gets tough now because when you're young and you just you sort of feel really strong and invincible and all the rest of it. I didn't think much of it, and I was just going to get better and come back and play and all the rest of it. But that time, um, obviously, uh, looking back on it now, it was tough, uh, and uh, not just mentally being told I'm not going to play. But as you said, is I'd just come back from Origin like two days before I wanted to play, you know. So 
I just come back from Origin, so I was just so excited, and things were just so good for me at that stage. Um, you know, I was playing. I was a regu- I was the Origin hooker, Queensland hooker at the time, and so I, it was pretty scary uh, coming off the field with that that injury, and and then being told that I may never play again uh, as a as a 22 year old. You know, 23 was just devastating uh, at the time you know I was I was getting married at the back end of that year and uh, things were just really exciting for me but then for that to happen it, it got pretty serious pretty quickly and everything uh, I look back at it now as a real challenging time neck braces and all the rest of it and, and my dream of being a you know a, a 10 year player or whatever just it was it was scary. I, I'm not gonna lie. It was pretty scary, and then to be told that and have to have surgery. You know, I've got a really big scar. And about the actual incident, um, a lot of people today. It's another thing I could probably post on your site, guys. I'll get you the footage. But people are like, uh, sometimes people question the crusher tackle. Yeah. If they want to see a crusher tackle and what it can do to someone, um, I'll show you some scars on the back of my neck that are, you know, the length of my neck, and metal in there because of a crusher tackle i don't believe it was on purpose it, it, it was an accident but it was a crusher tackle and and yeah after that tackle it was pretty scary and i heard a couple of little cracks in my neck mm. probably could have just been my neck cracking you know as people yeah. do it but regardless i heard it and i quickly wiggled my fingers and toes and if anyone sees the footage i'm laying there i sort of i did move it because i just thought to myself I've got to make sure I'm good here. And then straight after that, I go to hop up and I just get a real pain in my neck and mm. it got a little bit scary. And I sort of went, oh, and just stayed back down because it, it, it just shot some pains down my body a bit. And as you know, uh, that was the last time I played football for nearly two years. Yeah. Uh, and being told, yeah, it was, it was scary. And those times of the rehab and stuff, Look, it was scary. The first operation didn't even work. Uh, a lot no, of people yeah. know that. You know, it didn't work. And then the second time, they cut through the front of my neck here. Um, and I was prepared to um, sort of, I suppose, give it a give it away. Like I said, I didn't want to. I was scared. Uh, but it it turns out, you know, down the track, I'll, they said, look, if you if it heals and goes well, you'll be you're fine to play, but that'll be up to you and your call. But yeah, it was tough times. Eh? There was lots of real bad moments being told the first operation didn't work and that how tough it was for not only myself, but my fiance at the time and wife now, Kelly, like to think that, you know, I, I was in a chair and you, you just lay back and then my wife or Kelly would be bringing me food and I, was, I couldn't move because it was really difficult to walk. Um, the, the, the pain that, sort of pushed down on me slash in the neck uh, for a while in the rehab was just probably excruciating. It was just, a, but, and obviously being on tablets, um, strong morphine tablets and things, I'd just hop up and just have to shuffle and my wife would help me go to the toilet and things like that. And, you know, I'm only 22 and my wife, you know, at the time girlfriend, she's only, you know, 19 herself. It was tough. Um, you know, and then I literally wouldn't move from the chair. I stayed there and then uh, what I would do is then when I want to go to sleep, the doctor said just to make sure you don't wake up in pain, you've got to take an extra tablet and, and now I would literally just go to sleep, wake back up in like a reclining chair. And it was tough, but, you know, I, I just just had to do it. You know, the second one was really tough after, as I said to you before about not working. Yeah. To think that I had to go through it all again, I, I, I probably... I, I didn't even want to because it was so tough. But it turns out the second operation through the neck was a little bit less recovery time and it wasn't, um, I had no rubbing on from the neck brace because it got infected and things like that. Just the list of things went on, you know, how hard or what that was. But the second one was a lot easier. So when I got that done and then come back and yeah, it wasn't to be to stay at the Warriors, uh, wasn't my own plan to ever leave I, I, I was happy at the club I loved the club and in particular off the field I, I, I really had um, you know, come to love New Zealand and 
and it, it, it's still now a real special place for my wife and I. We were engaged uh, over there and all, you know, and we had some, you know, successful times and all the rest of it. So it's a special place for us. But, uh, you know, the recovery and just towards the end of it, things started to look like I may never be able to play again. So there was a bit of doubt with clubs and, and the Warriors thinking, well, what's the point of holding on to him maybe? Uh, but also uh, it was tough on me and, you know, my partner being away from family. Yeah. So it was sort of a bit, end up being a bit of a mutual thing. I think the Warriors were happy to sort of let us go because uh, I was at that stage looking like I wouldn't play ever again. And I sort of wanted to go home. So, and at that stage it was, um, oh, I believe yeah, we actually, we actually were, yeah, we, when the second operation come around, actually, yeah, we were married and we were expecting our first child. So we just, I just decided it was, you know, my wife and I would go home. Yep. Well, home for her to Sydney. So that was a decision made and it was, it was tough, but um, yeah, it wasn't the be to stay at the Warriors at the time. But I, I, I love my time there. It was, yeah. Yeah, as, as you said, that, that injury, I mean, it, it kept you out for the remainder of 2003 and obviously 2004 and a bit of a bit of a personal story. The very first time I ever went to Mount Smart Stadium was round two in 2004, uh, a game against St. George. And I actually sat right behind you um, at the game because you were sitting there with the players, like the, I think some of the reserve grade guys and the guys that weren't playing. I remember texting my dad saying, I'm sitting, I'm sitting behind PJ Marsh and dad, dad's just like, I'll give him a thick ear. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I remember, I remember seeing the scar on the, on the back of your neck and everything yeah. as well. It just, it just made it so real. And, and, and sadly, I mean, I, well, it wasn't another time, but that we weren't going to see you in a Warriors jersey again. Um, yeah. yeah, which was massive because you're a much loved part of the club and, and, you're synonymous with that 2002 season and the run to the to the finals. So yeah, it was hugely disappointing for all of us. But um, as you said, you end up you end up going back to Australia. Um, how did you find your way back to the Eels? Yeah, uh, as as you said, right, just touch on that bit about New Zealand. Like it's as I said, it's just such a special place. I'm not sure I just had a real connection with you know, New Zealanders in particular, just everyone, I just had a real connection and so did my wife. It's just such a special place and that's why the Warriors and we were winning and successful and all those sorts of things you're saying is why I consider it to be my team and and I just, yeah, I'm not just saying that because I'm on here with you, but I love Warriors. You know, I've got a Warriors jersey um, I bought for a Father's Day, you know, a few years back. It's That's my team, so... Yeah, I love watching them and I hope they can just keep doing better. But, you know, I would have, I could have, I suppose I could have possibly just really hung in there and stayed, but it wasn't the be. But I found my way back to Parramatta. Um, look, I put on a lot of weight considering, when I say a lot of weight for, for my small frame, I got up to 93 kilos because it was always easier for me to lose weight than to put it on. And oh, you're so lucky. I was just, and I was just, yeah, well, that's what everyone was just thinking. So I was eating a lot just trying to put on some good weight and stuff like that because I remember, like, you know, if I wasn't eating good foods, I'd lose a lot of weight. And I'd, once the neck operation and all the rest of it sort of had finished and I was sort of on my way thinking I could come back, I um, because I'd lost so much weight, I was only about 72 kilograms and when I had the neck and all the rest of it. So I thought I'll do that and I... I just put on a fair bit of weight and, and what happened was is my manager rang me and said, what's to go? And I'd been cleared to play. I just didn't know that if I was ever going to be cleared. Went to see the specialist just for my final appointment. It was a um, specialist in, Param um, in from Parramatta, the club. And they said, look, you're all good. And he said, so who are we going to see you playing for next season? Because it was in the off season. And I went, oh, oh. I'm not sure if I'm going to play football again, you know. And he's like, well, you can if you want. And so I can't even get a scoop, you know. <laughs> and because um, he, he actually, you know, was a para fan, uh, this guy. And it turns out that um, I started thinking, hang on, you know, I want to play. Some people would say it was silly and stupid and, you know, um, for, for playing then after a serious neck operation. But it's all I knew and I loved what I was doing and, um, you know, I just, 
you know, the, I, I, I just had, didn't feel like I was done and I knew how hard and how dedicated I, I am to training and, and, and to, to getting my body back in shape that it, it was not going to be, that wasn't going to be the issue. It was just going to be whether I can get over the fact that, you know, practically there was a fracture of a broken neck. Can I get over the fact that I'm going to get hit again and people are going to throw me around? So that was more to the point, I suppose, with the um, being cleared. But uh, one of the trainers, Craig Cataract, good friend of mine. I'm still good mates with him now. Um, Hayden Knowles, another one. Um, he was with Panthers this year for their strength and conditioning. But good mates with him. And I rang Cat and said, oh, what are you up to, mate? And he just goes, oh, not much, not much. And he goes, I was literally about to call you. And I said, what was that? And he goes, oh, look, mate, um, why don't you come back to Parramatta? Because he was a trainer at the time and stuff. And I said, oh, look, I'm, I don't know, mate. I'm pretty out of shape. And by that time, that whole putting on weight to then lose it, it, it was not as easy as I thought it was going to be. Um, so, so I was, I was 90 TKGs and, um, it, yeah, and my friend Kat just said to me, let's go to training and why don't we see what we're going to do and we'll see. And then when that got out that I'd been to a training session at Parramatta, I had a couple of offers come in from different, um, different teams and uh, I thought one of them was just my mates making a joke with us, but... Uh, it turned out it was Tim Sheens. He rang us to say that he um, wanted us to go to the Tigers that year. And he goes, I've got a young fellow here that's doing pretty good, but look, he'd be understudy, uh, Robbie Farrer. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So because at the time he was a young fellow. And, um, but then I talked to Cat about it, and it was only probably, I said, I won't sign anything yet. I, let's see how I go. And I just remember jumping on the treadmill. And we're doing like a two minute on, 30 off, all this sort of stuff. And I normally would have just ate it up, you know, when I was playing and full on. And then after about, I think it was only two, two minute lots, I just said to Cat, I can't do it, mate. I'm just, you know, and he, and he was just expecting the old PJ to sort of be there just to smash out fitness stuff and just work really hard. And I just couldn't do it. And I said, look, don't worry about it, mate. And I just walked out of the gym and went home and, and uh, talked to my wife um, at the time and just, we talked to her and she goes, well, why don't you just start a bit slower? Maybe start walking and stuff like that. So I started walking and things like that. Just slowly lost a, lost a bit of weight, got fit. And, um, yeah, it was only probably about three weeks later I signed a, just a one-year contract just to see how I was going to go. And, yeah, uh, it wasn't long after. I was pre-season training. Obviously, I wasn't doing any contact. I didn't feel comfortable to do contact for probably yeah. a lot of the pre-season. And then towards the back end of the pre-season, um, uh, Fui Fui Moi Moi, pretty small human. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we were we were doing the wrestling training, and it was just like you had to go and you challenge. And long story short, Fui picked me up and threw me halfway across the uh, Parramatta gym, and I landed like on my shoulder slash neck. <laughs> the whole gym just went silent because cool. we we're all in a circle, yeah. and the whole gym and every every player just went silent and just thought, "Does he know that?" It- PJ's coming back from a broken neck. And uh, it was at that point that I thought, oh, well, I'm ready to play. Because That's a good test. I, I <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, down the PCYC at um, Parramatta. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, and then come back in a pre-season game versus Cronulla, actually. So it was, um, yeah, it was pretty scary. It was a pretty emotional day for myself. Um, I don't think any of the people realise why I was so emotional. In this little country dressing shed, I believe it was, um, you, you know, how they go to the country and play. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was one of those. I'm trying to think where we were. Um, yeah, just a little country town, you know, and I'm sitting in the sheds and I, I was pretty emotional that day. Just mm. think this has been a long road. It's been two years um, since I've played and uh, it's going to be pretty scary, but, uh, you know, let's see how this goes. And, and as I said, I, it was it was scary. But got through the game quite well, and um, same same deal there. I think I was trying to sort of play in the halves a bit again, but as I said, Tim Smith, he was the new kid on the block, and he played in that trial match as well. And when he went to the halves, and I, I went to hooker, and then or, and then rested, um, he just destroyed them. <laughs> so I don't. Uh, I, that's when I took that role uh, back on as a hooker with Mark Rebell. I never really played in the halves again because Timmy played quite well, but 
But yeah, it's pretty uh pretty full on the, the comeback game, mate. Eh? Even though it was You're a, um, a lot of sliding door moments in that that two year period in there. Like, you know, I mean, you don't get injured. We don't know how long you you stay at the Warriors and you know what that would have done uh for our club over the next couple of years. Mm. You you get looked at by the Tigers and uh for <laughs> two thousand five they go on and win that comp yeah. uh, in two thousand and five. Yes. But testimony to how and you talk about your love of New Zealand, testimony to um the love that the fans have for you as a player you as, as you said you only played 38 40 games for the club over a year and a half but and you know we've had hookers like um you know Sidiru, um jason deeth robbie mears uh, yourself you know uh monty uh aaron Haramaya, ian henderson yeah. isaac luke you are Nathan always friend, a player yeah. that that is picked in everyone's um greatest ever warriors 17 and I think that's testament to just the way you play at the club and yeah. um yeah the level of energy and enthusiasm you, you brought it you you were yeah everyone's favorite hooker mate you were a sensational player nah. for our club yeah oh, look, yeah yeah like i said well, we, i played with some great players like it was made a lot easier um you know i look back at it now and yeah it was it was it was good times and to be considered even though i remember when they named the 20 year team like fans or something, I was in that, and yeah, it is. It's pretty special. Um, yeah, yeah, to be considered, a, you know, one of the, the best hookers, you know, to come out of the Warriors. Absolutely, mate. Um, going back to like 2005 now. So not only do you find your way back to the field, uh, amazingly, you play uh, 74 games for the Eels over the next th three seasons, 2005 to 2007. It's a remarkable comeback story, isn't it? Um, you must pinch yourself considering what, you know, the, the mental side of things that you went through 2003, 2004 to, you know, where you ended up a couple of seasons later. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone's got a hard luck story and I, I, I nearly quit and I, I nearly did this and, you know, everyone's got one of those stories and I suppose look like it's, you can look at it that way and, and I'm not going to say it was easy, um, the comeback, but, you know, it was definitely, uh, yeah, it was definitely, I suppose, you know, pretty special to be able to come back and it was tough. But, yeah, as you said, the 2005 season to come back and, and play so many games and all the rest of it, yeah. You know, over the next season, like I said, we were really successful. I suppose yeah. the next three seasons, 74 games. I, I remember, the, I think it might have been the last, you know, the second last year I was there. You know, I was got a 100-year jersey presented to me, a um, 100 game jersey from Nathan Ironmarsh and, and all the rest of it. So, yeah, it was it was, it was was pretty good to be able to come back, you know, considering I was told I wouldn't and couldn't. And, and I'm not going to lie, I wasn't the same player. Um, you know, a lot of people, I had some good games when I came back, but I was never the same player as uh, beforehand. It was, it was always a little bit in the back of my mind, I suppose. Um, yeah. You know, obviously having a family uh, by this stage in life, it was... It, it was pretty scary to think that if I was to do something to my neck again, I may never walk again. So, yeah. But look, I did battle on for you know a few a few more years with the you know playing and stuff like that. And there were some successful times in there. Like I said, from good games, that, especially that year as well. Yeah. Did we well? Yeah. Yeah. Got, there's actually quite a few questions coming through in the chat. We'll get to those um, a little bit later. So yeah, thanks for your questions, guys. But um yeah pj we sort of mentioned this before but every season that you played from your debut season in 2000 to 2007 you played in teams that made the semi-finals and you know that's an achievement that you should be proud of looking back on your career yeah definitely is uh, as i said uh, when i finished playing football it was all i'd ever done and i got a little bit sort of i suppose you know depressed a bit about not playing but um Always, yeah, playing in successful sides, um, it, it is. It's, um, you know, it's always a good thing and, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we, we won, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, look, well, yeah. You, you go to the Broncos, they're not so successful. Uh, 2008, 2009, um, you signed with the Broncos. Two seasons that you uh, pretty much interrupted for you with injury again. Was it the neck injury again, that flared up, that forced you to have so much time off the field during those two seasons? 
Uh, it was a little bit of the neck, but obviously a lot of things stem from that. Um, yeah. You know, I had a, my back was a little bit sore as well and things like that and just had some freakish sort of injuries. I remember I must have got hit in an early game and then going to training, I sneezed and then sort of cracked a rib. Uh, but it was probably there before. But, um, yeah, look, there was a few injuries in there, but it was probably, yeah, it was a mixture of everything, you know. I was a bit, always a bit, as I said, never the same player coming back after that and always that worry about um, life after football, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. It, so looking back on your career, um, you, you must be proud of what you achieved. Obviously, so much success at the Eels, but also with the Warriors as well. You must, you must have been, must have been proud to look back at, at all you had achieved. Yeah, it is. State, um, state of origin as well, of course. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I end up. I remember at the Broncos, I, I didn't play a lot of games, but I did get selected for one more state of origin. And uh, yeah, look, there's, looking back at it, of course, I'm super proud. I, I'm a kid from Blackwater that was told I was too small as kids and stuff like that. And like I said, there's everyone's got a hard luck story, but. You know, I can look at it like I was missed out on and this and that, and I hurt my neck and things like that. And But, you know, I'm always proud of what I've done. Um, I know thousands and thousands of young kids that would love to sort of do half what I've done. Uh, they just want to play one game in the NRL maybe. And, um, yeah, so always proud of what I've done and where I come from. And, you know, I know everyone back home, you know, I've recently moved back, they're all proud of what I've done and, in my career, um, as you said, Origin. Well, you know, I wanted to play in the NRL. Who would have ever thought that I, you know, I'd go on to now play, you know, four Origins? And so, yeah, pretty proud, definitely. Is there a um, is there a PJ Mars statue in Blackwater? <laughs> no, I think there might be an old rickety stand, but I'm not sure. If you know, <laughs> on. Just just on but, the neck injury, um, when. When Alex McKinnon went through what he went through, did that kind of bring back some memories for you? And did you reach out to him at the time uh, with what he was going through? No, I didn't. I didn't obviously do that. Obviously, they've got people around them and stuff like that. And there's nothing worse than hearing from some bloke that you know says, "Look, I did this with my neck." His situation is different than mine. Mine's yeah. different. Yeah. You know, many things like that. But um, I do remember the the incident. Yeah, it was it was pretty scary and. Um, Mm. Yeah, I didn't. No, I didn't really reach out to him or anything either. So. And post footy, mate, what have you been doing? In my extensive research, I sort of done some work with Use through Headspace um, at some point. Uh, are you still involved in that, or and or are you still involved in the game in some way? Uh, not, not so much. Uh, I've always just done youth work and always wanted to help young kids out. You know, whether it be in football or whether it be in life. Um, I believe I've had a lot of life experiences and stuff like that. But um, no, I was only at Headspace for about two years. I, I moved on and um, went back to the mines. I, I work on a drill rig, so that's good. And I've had a bit of a stint at my old uh, school, uh, St. Brennan's College, uh, looking after one of the dorms. So that's what sort of I've been up to. And uh, when it comes to football, uh, next season is probably the first season I'm going to really get involved. I'm going to coach one of my boys. Um, uh, when I finished football, I was a bit dark on football. Um, yeah. I was really upset about w what had been taken from me rather than focusing on what I achieved. So I, I got away from sort of everything. I moved it back out west and, and life, um, yeah, I'm not one to sort of show anything. I'd, I was a bit bit dark on footy, so it was hard to be involved. I know my young, oldest boy was coming of age to be able to play football and I didn't want him to because um, I hated it. I hated everything, but since obviously then I've learned to focus on what I achieved rather than what was taken from us and not being able to play anymore. Yeah. But next season, yeah, I'm going to coach me uh, my youngest fella actually. I meant the youngest fella, in he's in the under 14. So uh, that's my involvement, and I, I still just run water every now and again for some teams that my boys might play in. And yeah, my, it's funny my family they all three of them. I got an older daughter that. Um, is playing football as well. So, yeah, I'm getting more and more involved, but I, I really did have not much involvement um, for years. Yeah, so just just to 
sort of put put another sort of warriors spin on it and as as we've said you you're absolutely a much love player of our history and you played through what was our most successful period um at a club that hasn't we haven't had like as much success as we would have liked but i mean you obviously enjoyed your time in new zealand and it must be special if you'd look back and say oh, i did play in that this probably the strongest warriors side that there's been yeah it is um that side of things is is always the biggest memory and that's why i still support them but looking back at that is yeah it was it was pretty amazing amazing times and that all contributes towards that um yeah I, you know playing with some of the best players that new zealand warriors have ever you know had at the club i think and like you said you, you're considered it's considered to be one of the better warriors sides you know ever to be around so the D best yeah <laughs> yeah so look they're special times yeah for sure um with the, with the club there's lots of there's so many memories it felt like i was there forever it really did so that yeah i think that was yeah <laughs> we wish I know there was the second be. part of the question what was the other bit yeah <laughs> Oh no, we're just saying we wish you we wish you had a bit of a you know slightly longer yeah. career. It wasn't it wasn't to be, but um, no. no, we still have the memories of you know the the eighteen months that we you did have wearing this uh, wearing this proud jersey. Yeah, that's one of the good ones. I remember that. That was yeah. the grand final year, is it? It is. Yeah, absolutely. Always bring out the uh, the two thousand and two jersey for all our OGs that we're lucky enough to <laughs> chat to. So yeah. of course, had to do the same for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> No, it was definitely, yeah, like I said, that, and I, I said it earlier and I've said it over and over, you know, being a successful club and winning games is obviously, you know, contributes to it being really fond memories. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mate, on, as, as you said, you are speaking about your kids before. Um, they obviously take after you because young, young Braylon, he's represented Queensland in the Schoolboy National Championships and recently yeah. your daughter, who you said plays footy, um, Waverly, she's... She, mate, she looks like she's going to be an NRLW star of the future. She's got some uh, speed and some pace, uh, scored a couple of good tries, and, and she's just been selected for Queensland as well, I think. Um, yeah, proud dad much? Just like a merit side, but, yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was pretty much her first carnival. Look, she's got a lot to learn about rugby league, but she I've always said it. Everyone always says, so who's the most talented? And they're, and they're clearly asking about Braylon and Jay, my two boys. Yeah. And I said, well, their older sister. I'd have yeah. to say maybe might even edge him out a little bit, but I said she she just uh, probably not quite as dedicated to football as the boys are, but she's starting to love it and really you know grow. So um, look, they're um, yeah they they're doing really really well. As you said, Braylon he was um, in the Queensland 12 side. He's 15 this year. He, he yeah. missed out on the Queensland 15 side, but yeah they all love their they love their football and they're doing really really well. Yeah. Um... Mate, the, the good thing for Waverley too is now there's such a part, there's a, a great pathway for girls coming through in rugby league, which you know wasn't there many years ago. So um, hopefully she keeps at it because the uh, the stuff that you posted uh, of her playing the other week was um, yeah that was pretty impressive stuff. And Grandma's proud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, she will be. No, she played really well, mate. It was it was quite. Yeah. It was just you know for me it's still my little girl. <laughs> yeah. So, She's, she's um she's taller than I am and she's got some real wheels so you know if she can really learn how the the you know the ins and outs the smaller things about the game I think she could be really successful uh, uh, in the women's game for sure and uh, I think so too. yeah here's here's hoping I know she's starting to take a real liking to it and, that's good uh, yeah it's awesome yeah. yeah. Mate, um, Rob's just going to ask you a couple of quick rapid-fire questions that we ask um, all our guests when they come I on. Say, mate, I get, I get yeah, lost in half my answers. I've taken it, done a camper, so I'm going to get lost. Well, mate, time. so long as you don't, so long as you don't do a pricey to us, mate, we'll uh, we'll all need sleeping bags. <laughs> I think I told you I've been hitting the head too many times. <laughs> That's my excuse. Well, these ones are rapid fire, and I'm just going to. These are rapid them. fire. Yep. Yeah. So, so who was your toughest teammate? Kevin Campion. Who was the best sledger that you played with or against? Francis Melly. Francis Melly. Yeah, he just feels real cheeky. It's just always something cheeky. 
Like haven't you watched the videos when it hits someone? I was like, you know, as if they stay well, out of my way. We'll have to ask Brent Tate about that. Hey, yeah. he got Tate a few times. Yeah. Oh, Tate nearly knocked his head off that day. <laughs> he hit him so hard. But I'd say Francis Malley, but it was it was all tongue in cheek, very funny. Okay, biggest pest? Oh, probably Stacy. Stacy. Yeah, bit of a pest, reason, was he? The reason I won't say, but yeah, <laughs> I had to bring him a couple of times. He's a bit, yeah. <laughs> I think most of the O2 guys said you, actually. <laughs> yeah, that was probably because I was the only one that didn't drink, so they'd all be a little bit sometimes hung over on the plane, and I'd always just get, tap them on the shoulder, hey, Tooks, Tooks, hey, what time is it? And, and then he'd go, mate, no one cares. Like, you know, and then two minutes later after he falls asleep again, I'd just tap him again. And I said, mate, it's my fault you're staying out a bit late. <laughs> um. Who is your toughest opponent? Uh, Gordon Tallis. Raging bull. Uh, yeah, I still remember one day stuck in the back play and he ran hard at me. And I was thinking, I'm just going to grab him. Before I could grab him, he grabbed me. <laughs> he <laughs> screwed me out the way. I was like, okay. <laughs> nah, he's, yeah, Gordon Tallis, definitely. Yeah, awesome. Who was the most professional in regards to game prep? Nathan Kalis. Just very professional about everything. Yeah. Yeah, I can believe that. Um, who was the best trainer? Uh, not I'll wrap myself up. It's probably me, easy. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's funny thing about Tooks. He's, he's been telling stories. I'll tell you one about Tooks. This is from Tooks' words as well. He was one of the hardest trainers. I remember. He'd ride to training with a sweatsuit on and it'd be from Pakaranga, which is a fair ride. Like yeah. we're talking, take him an hour because he's trying to sweat some weight off. And then he'd get to training and then sit on the tr um, the rower for about another hour. Then he'd hop on the bike for another hour and then he'd weigh in. And um, so he was one of the toughest trainers. Yeah, right. But his words, he uh, he could eat harder. <laughs> 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 I was going to say, there's got, there's got to be a catch here somewhere. <laughs> oh, 100%. So, look, he used to train hard, hey, Tooks did. Well, look, Nathan it doesn't... Highmarsh, Nathan, if we really want to talk, Nathan Highmarsh was one of the best. Yeah. You know, I was it's, skinny, that little, skinny little that... half, and he would match it with me from Vikas. That um, doesn't surprise me about Tooks because you see him now. He, he trains for triathlons. He's, yeah. he's really slimmed yeah. down a lot. So, yeah, he always probably had that in him. But as you said, he was... You know, in the, in the grand final of the eating competitions, that's for sure. <laughs> too, it's too much dirty bird, eh? Hundred <laughs> uh, percent. I was people throwing through his window. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he could train hard, dudes. But Nathan Highmarsh was definitely one. Like I said, I was seventy something kilograms lighter than anything, and he'd match it with me on beat tests. So yeah, yeah. Right. he was he was definitely. Good. Who was a who was a team comedian? Oh, comedian. Oh, Wade McKinnon was pretty good back in the day at Parramatta. Yeah. It was probably more just listening to him and Paul Stringer, another player we had, just having oh, yeah, a Paul Stringer. So they just have a bit of a running feud with each other. And yeah, it was pretty interesting to listen to. So I had a great stint at the Warriors as well, Wade McKinnon. Um, yeah, one of yeah, our great fullbacks. He yeah. Played a lot more football. He yeah, definitely. Really um, and last rapid fire question who, who was the worst trainer? Look, Henry Farfili and Justin Murphy were up there. <laughs> oh, the wingers. <laughs> but, uh, look, I'm going to probably say when it comes to um, if we're talking Warriors or we're talking at all, but er Eric Graff Jr. was probably one of the best. He yeah. as in to miss training. <laughs> oh, to miss training. <laughs> he, anything to do with fitness, just, uh, yeah, he didn't like it, didn't do it, just yep. and was one of the most powerful blokes. You know, he never trained. He was always on his last set in the gym, you know. Whenever the coach would say, Eric, are you doing your bench press? He goes, yeah, I'm on my last set. <laughs> <laughs> He'd just walk around the gym for like about an hour, uh, you know, uh, oh. just having a yarn to everyone individually. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Procrast so procrastinating, yeah. yeah. <laughs> lovely, lovely Blake, but probably up there with some of the most talented, um, naturally talented uh, players I've ever met, and that's probably why he could do that, you know.
Mm. Uh, we got we got some uh, questions coming in from the viewers. Uh, from Mark Roberts, what does PJ think about the Warriors nines at the moment? Uh, does he believe people should allow the likes of Egan and Otacolo to develop properly? Uh, well, how I feel about the coach. Sorry, mate. Wait there, I won't be set. I've got some mob over here being a bit noisy. <laughs> yeah. Waverly. Waverly. Quiet. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, that's all good. I just, I'm just quieting them down there. <laughs> no, look, um, yeah, what was – sorry, mate, I missed the uh, – The question was, what do you think about the current nines at the Warriors in Egan and Otacol? Oh, the current nines. Uh, I, I, I haven't watched a lot of it, uh, a lot of individuals, if you know what I mean. Um, yep. So, to be honest, I probably can't really comment too much on, um, you know, yeah, the actual nines, really, uh, that are playing. I watch a little bit of, you know, don't sort of pay attention to it, just checking scores and highlights. Yep. Yep. Um, do you have a most embarrassing moment on the field? Oh, on the field. Well, um, nah, not really that I could think of. I'd probably be just, yeah, made up and, Plenty off the field, but we don't really need to go there. <laughs> <laughs> did, did I remember when I did try putting on weight, the boys were playing a joke on Fred Webb and that they filled out my player profile. And I put on that weight that I was telling you about trying to try and do it. And, and yeah, I looked a bit, you know, a bit fuller. <laughs> yeah. Feel <laughs> nicer way of putting fat. Full full. <laughs> I, remember Webb, I remember Webby and um, uh, Ando from the, in the centres, um, Oh, far, I can't remember. Vinny Anderson. There you yeah, go. I can't remember him, mate. But uh, they they got a hold of my profile and filled it out for me. And apparently, my favourite food was uh, KFC. My favourite uh, activities away from football: eating KFC. Uh, <laughs> and they just tossing all this up. And if it wasn't for one of the ladies, just sort of in the office, just going, "Well, this doesn't it doesn't look right," because they made a fair bit of it believable. She's coming out and going, "PJ, is this yours?" And I'm looking at it, and they're over there laughing, and I'm thinking, these blokes, you know, so a bit embarrassing, putting on a bit of weight, and the boys just ripping me. <laughs> Here's one. Um, since your departure, uh, say, from players from 2005 to two, uh, 2021 at the Warriors, who would be the one that you would like to have played with the most? Uh, look, you can't get past Sean Johnson. Yeah. Um, mm. You know, I remember when I met him. I, uh, you know, players these days are so much bigger. He's like a, he's like a giant next to me. Uh, he's, yeah, actually a, he's actually a big guy. He's deceptively he's, big, yeah. He's the same yeah. size as me. It, it kind of really threw me when I met him for the first time because he's actually a little bit taller. And I thought he plays halfback. Like, yeah, where's he playing the back row? Look, I would have loved to have played with him. It, you know, the things he does, and as I said, I'm excited for what we what we can see. It's obviously going to be a more experienced um, and yeah. calmer player that we're going to see from him, and hopefully it becomes a bit more like a general role, like Stacey, where he runs yeah. the team around. And I'm I'm hopeful for that. And you know he'll control one side of the ruck, and we'll see how it goes. What was your most memorable moment in your career? There'd be a few. Yeah, there's a few. I, I think you probably can't go past playing State of Origin. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just yeah I can't even describe the feeling even now I like to think you know because I'm walking around I'm only like as I said a little guy you know and I'm not like someone a me rem like real rememberable face or anything so you know just, and then when someone says oh yeah that's PJ or something like that he's a friend of mine so, and then they they sort of look you up and down thinking Did this guy plays State of Origin like really like, <laughs> you know so it's just it's pretty special to, yeah. Play origin. I would have to say it would be the most memorable by far. Who were your heroes growing up? Uh, Alan Lang and Robbie o. Davis. Um, if you hadn't have played uh, NRL or became an NRL player, what career path do you think you would have um, fallen into? Yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. I'm, it'd be scary to think where I'd be. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, and um, who was the biggest influence on your career, mate? Uh, look, I think it was 
definitely my parents, my, my dad in particular, like the, the amount of effort that uh, where I lived in the Central Highlands that uh, parents had to go through to get you to games was pretty phenomenal. So he was, you know, dad and mum, they were big influence because they the way they supported all of, you know, my siblings and myself. Like games, sometimes we'd have to travel four hours on the Saturday just to play a game. Yeah. Uh, and dad would drive me there and he'd load our little, little mini bus up with even some of my mates and stuff. So definitely my dad. And then, look, in the senior career and, and things like that, look, Paul White, the, as I said before, great mate of mine. And um, just sort of the advice and stuff he'd give me early on in, in – before I sort of even went to Sydney, um, just a real big influence on me I, at the time. Uh, probably not doing all the things that I should have been doing right. Yep. Uh, on the field and off the field, even as a young fella, you know, getting into a bit of mischief sometimes. But uh, and Whitey at the time was a police officer in town and our coach and all the rest of it. So he uh, he he just got me to training sessions and everything like that and just gave me my shot. And, yeah, since then, obviously, you know, I had lots of chats with him about, you know, playing and all footy and all the rest of it. So, yeah. Mum might be crying now because she's just put up, we are proud to be yeah. your parents. She could have a tear in her eye, I reckon, mate. Yeah, yeah mum gets pumped up a bit, eh? <laughs> it's good. It's good. Uh, yeah, mate, um, so definitely a big influence, uh, I don't yeah. know, parents. To, to go to those efforts and those lengths, yeah. Were you, were you a superstitious guy? Did you have any pre-game rituals or, or game day routines that you used to go through? No, nothing like that. Nah, just... Throw yeah, some boots and go and have fun, yeah? Pretty, yeah, pretty run of the mill, just get us out there. Mate, the final question um, is that someone posted is, um, what advice would you give young kids coming through now um, you know, wanting to make a career out of footy? Um, the advice I give, and I give it to my my kids as well, is, is it's that old one about how, you know, talented and talent will only get you so far. Work hard and, and you know, you've got to have some talent. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, I, you can't go just pick any kid and say you're going to play in the NRL if you train hard. You know, it, it may not be talented enough to start with. But, look, I always, the advice I give to kids now is um, when it comes to sort of just life in general, I think, you know, um, uh, alcohol and drugs obviously is just a big thing. Just it should be a no, no go. If you want to play in the NRL, then I would suggest any kid past, you know, of a young age until they're at least 25, 26 should never drink a drop of alcohol at all. Um, the, the advantages you can get from that and training hard. But the biggest one for me is just, just training hard. You know, that's the yeah. advice because I wasn't the best player. I was an average player. And everyone goes, oh, my mate's, one of my mate's biggest fan, Nathan Sandlin's, oh, Ernie, he goes, no way, you weren't. And he goes, average players don't play, you know, 180 games in origin. And I said, they do if they train hard. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because there was a lot more talented players than me out there. There was so much more talented, but I was willing to just train hard. Um, as I said, as a young fella, you know, you know, not drinking alcohol, all those sorts of things. When I got into grade, that that um, that's what I tell kids. You know, uh, are just, you are you kind of glad that you came through a period where there wasn't social media? Um, because they like the kids coming through now. They get scrutinised so so much by um, their what they post on the social media platforms and so forth. Yeah, it it is tough. There's a lot of pressure that comes with stuff like that too. Like you said, yeah, the social media they're always their games are always can be critiqued a little bit. Now you can't just go home and say mm. you played awesome <laughs> to your mates yeah. and they'll check it. They'll be like, hang on, I watched that game yeah. on live or something. But um, look, coming through, yeah. Oh, it doesn't. It, I can't say that I'm glad or anything like that um, with it. it. I suppose that was just a personal choice of mine. I suppose to um, you know to, to make sure I'm out doing the right things and stuff like yeah. that, and you know not trying not to get pressure put on yourself. But I must admit, yeah, if you if you ask on social media, is it is it a pressure thing? And I'm happy about it. Yeah, I know that it's um, can get people into a bit of trouble. Like you know, 
you're looking at what's been happening with the NRL players at the moment, things yep. like that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but uh, yeah, they're a bit. Uh, there's a few dodgy things happening, but it's 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 not good good look for the game. No, mate. We um we really want to thank you for for coming on, uh, chatting with us tonight. Um, we feel so privileged that we're able to connect with uh, ex players such as yourself. Uh, give you a platform to to tell your stories and your yarns, uh, and you know you're integral in a period of the club in. in of uh, a lot of success. Um, we have a bit of a saying here on Ruin Hammer, uh, those who have played for our club are forever and always, and you, mate, are forever and always warrior number 96. Uh, thanks, guys. It's, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. You know, I, I love having a yarn. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, you know, I'm happy that, like I said, uh, you're talking about stuff that's um, obviously fond memories, so it's great for me. Yeah. 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 Being, being on, having a chat. Yeah, and, and further testament to the impression that you have left over in New Zealand, the legacy you got there. I mean, uh, TK, probably one of the biggest Warriors fans you'll ever met, ever meet, and I'm sure that you would have met him during your time at the club. He's just saying, us Kiwis still love you, PJ. And, and yeah, it's just a further testament to, to how fondly you are remembered amongst all Warriors fans. Um, it's an honour to be able to connect with you as it is with, with, and with all our ex-players and to share those connections with those that are watching us. And we really appreciate your time tonight. Uh, yeah, as, as I said, it's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I, I can't, um, I can't thank New Zealand enough as well. As I said, it was, it's, it's still a special place for us. Um, you know, my wife and I. So look, it, it was a pleasure playing for the Warriors, and it was a shame it didn't wasn't longer. But um, mm. yeah, definitely some fond memories, and it's been great just getting on here and chatting anyway, guys. So I'll, I'll be yeah. Glad that's probably taking up too much time. I could chat forever. It doesn't worry me, but half the time I get lost with what I'm saying. But, uh, yeah, I, you know, I can see some stuff coming up there even now. I see you yeah. talk about Reese Walsh and stuff there. <laughs> but, uh, it's, um, been, yeah. our, our off-season didn't start real well for us, did it? <laughs> no, not exactly. No, that, that, no. That's probably probably the, the best thing, one of the best things I got out of this tonight was that, you know, you played – Majority of your career at Parramatta, but your club is the Warriors. I I, I love that. I absolutely we love, that. love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nah, it's, it's yeah. As I said, I can't take. It's a special place. We we we. I've been dying to get back over there. We've got some friends over there and um, yep. things like that. We we we'd love to get back over there. I remember for years I'd call it like I'd say, oh, we're heading home, like home, or I'm going to go back over back over to New Zealand. Yeah. And people are like. What do you mean? You're not actually from there, are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a special place. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, really appreciate it. We'll catch up with no you again soon. All, guys. Thanks, BJ. All right. Thank Cheers, you. mate. Thank you. What's that? Oh, mate, it's always awesome. I, it's I, something about chatting. Something about the players that era. They just have the best stories to tell, don't they? Oh, you, you never, you never get tired of hearing about, you know, like the two thousand and two period. It's, it's, yeah. it's such a, it's such a fondly remembered period from the club, as we said, probably our strongest ever team. And you just, you just love to hear the stories that come out. It's always something different every time. Yeah. Um, a different perspective and, yeah, different life lessons, I guess, that we get out of it as well. He's, um, he, he reminds me so much of of Jimmy Maloney because he's. Like a little bit of a larrikin, he's got that laid-back kind of um, attitude as well. Like very humble, uh, funny guy. Yeah, he kind of and and a winning, like he's he's just a winner. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Was a, that was a great one for me. I love that, um, and I hope everyone else did too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of Warriors news, there's a fair bit going on in in um, Clubland. Yep. So a little bit of postseason news from the Warriors in the past week that uh, I'll get your uh, thoughts on there, Hammer. Ash Taylor yeah. signs a train and trial deal with the option in his favour, the club for 2022 season. Uh, what's your thoughts on that one, mate? I think it's a, a really smart pickup from the club. Um, you know, without that one million dollar price tag, we've had this conversation, you know, amongst ourselves. Once, once without that one million dollar price tag over his head and and the expectations that come with that, I think it's a low cost, uh, low risk play by the Warriors in our halves. I think Taylor's 
proved he can play the game or any issue about him playing the game. It was just being that that leader to lead the Titans around. He wasn't that player. Um, you know, maybe giving the given the opportunity to play for a contract uh, rather than, you know, handed one is going to be the motivation he needs to to get that spark back, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think it'll be a good move. And I can see him, you know, uh, and we're going to talk about a couple of um, releases and so forth, but I can see him with, you know, some of the, the room they're making in the roster that he will probably get a... Uh, Probably get a, a, a contract uh, if he try if he trials real well well in the off season. Yeah, that's right. And his playing ability is has never really been in question. We always knew he could play. It's just the the pressures of the the contract that he had. And who wouldn't sign a million dollar contract if it was put in front of you? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean he'll add great depth to the halves, great kicking game, and he's an experienced player. So I, I think it's a, it's a great move all round. Yeah. Um, David Fusatua being granted an early release from the club uh, to take up a contract that leads Rhinos in the Super League. Good move, do you think? Um, yeah, it's always sad to see players depart, especially players that have had some sort of um, cult following uh, at times in their career. Fuss was our longest-serving warrior uh, in our current roster, having debuted in 2014. It's amazing to think now that our longest-serving warrior is actually Jazz Tavunga in that in the current um warriors scheme mm. um let's be honest you know he has struggled with form and injury and some personal issues in the past two seasons and we really haven't had him playing and we really haven't missed him uh my opinion i think dallin and uh hectic montoya are ahead of him in the pecking order and the game has gotten so fast that the the big hulking wingers aren't effective anymore uh, I think Fuss will be well suited to the Super League, and and yeah, I, I think we I, I wish him luck. So, yeah, I think it's a good move from the club. Um, you know, I, I do hear that we're going to pay some of his contract uh, to um, Leeds as well. I'm not sure what that is, but I mean, he, he was on six fifty at the Warriors, so that frees up a little bit of money in our in our coffers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, he had that great 2018 season uh, off. Uh, running up, you know, Sean Johnson. Yeah, uh, hasn't quite been himself the last few years. He did put on a bit of size, and I think uh, Mooks was looking at moving him into the centres. Um, obviously, that that didn't really come to fruition with like, injuries and the fact that, um, you know, yeah, well, basically injuries and he, he's had limited game time. So, yeah, wish him all the best. As he said, it's always sad to see players move on, but um, I'm, I'm sure he'll do well over there. Yeah. Um, Chris Walsh fronting court and getting a five hundred dollar fine and a good behaviour bond, but no conviction recorded. Satisfied? Mm, not really. Um, I'm glad he doesn't get a conviction recorded. Uh, I would have liked to have seen a tougher penalty with the fines, though, whether it be the courts or the NRL or the club. I know he's got uh, two games to serve next year after the the round one that he's already out for for his conduct on the field in the last game against the Titans. So he's he's going to be missing three games. I can handle that, uh, but it's the fines that uh, I don't like. I think the fines that they get given is like pocket money to them. Um, I, I don't think the fine acts as a deterrent. Uh, I think it's a, a bit of a, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm old school, yeah. though. Um, you know, the, the, the youth and young adults of today have grown up in that society where everything's softer on them, easier on them. They have this level of self-entitlement where, um, you know, we all have to be mindful of how we treat them or they crumble and play the, the mental health card. And I'm not saying that's what Reese Walsh should do, but, you know, that that happens a lot. And it's quite offensive to those who, who actually have real mental health problems. But um, mm. all that aside, it is what it is. And I, I sincerely hope he learns his lesson. But, yeah, I would have liked to have seen him find a little bit more money. Yeah, slightly tougher penalty. And yeah. finally, uh, Leeson Armau announcing his retirement, and we obviously wish him well. Thanks for his service to the club. Yeah, mate. Uh, he's been a, a great servant of the game. Uh, started his career at the Warriors back in 09. Only played one or two games back then. And then he had stints at the Cowboys and the Dragons before he, he came home to finish his career at the Warriors. Uh, played 223 games in his career, 46 for the Warriors. 25 tests for New Zealand and Samoa. Um, yeah, he's been a, a really good player, a uh, solid player. I think his best years were at the Dragons. Um, and, mm. yeah, we, we wish him well in retirement. He, he's choosing to retire to spend more time with his family. And, you know, you can't you can't argue against that, can you? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, wish him all the best and, yeah, enjoy some um, 
family time. Yeah, mate, we've got um, we've got some really great guests coming up. Um, uh, our live chats. Uh, who have we got? Mate, we've got Mark Graham coming up next week on uh, 27th of October. Kiwi legend and Hammer's favourite player of all time, I'm reliably told. Um, yep. Yeah, ki ki uh, Kiwi legend, uh, played for North Sydney, played for Brisbane North, played for, and coached the Warriors in 99 and 2000. So also interested to hear about um, his experience there as our head coach. Yeah, then yeah, tumultuous time too, wasn't it? Tumult e exactly, yeah. The 99-2000 was some of the toughest years in Warriors history. So interesting to hear about how that all went down, you know, and obviously under his his uh, uh, leadership there as the head coach. Yep. Uh, following that, we're going to be joined by Brent Tate on the 3rd of November, Wednesday, 3rd of November. Looking forward to that chat. He's uh, obviously his brother-in-law put in a good word uh for us <laughs> so he'll be coming on for a chat to talk about his his uh brief but memorable stint played three years for the warriors between 2008 and 2010 and um yeah, yeah obviously a queensland a queensland origin player and Australian international uh 2022 draw preview we'll be doing on the week after that so on the 10th of november Provided we'll be going through the draws the, out by then, yeah. Yeah, provided the draws out, we'll be going through that and looking at all the key matchups and uh, what it what it means for us supporters, whether we're up up this neck of the woods in Queensland, get some games at Redcliffe, or hopefully some games over at Mount Smart. Yep. And uh, obviously down in Sydney for you there as well. So we'll be we'll be breaking that down, hopefully. And Wednesday, seventeenth of November, we've got big show, the merchandise. Jack yes. Murchie coming on for a chat. He'll be talking all things uh, his for his Warriors career so far, 2020 to 2021, and obviously um, a big preseason coming up for him. Yeah, yeah. He played at the club for two years. Hasn't played at Mount Smart yet. It's, yeah, that's it. It's still never played at Mount Smart Stadium. Is yeah. one of those one of those for you. So it'd be interesting to hear his thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, and look, plus many more uh, to be announced as we lock in some dates. And um, we're hoping to get, this is a big one, get an exclusive live chat with one Ivan Cleary. Obviously, yep. uh, Premiership winning coach this year with the Panthers, but none of us will ever forget his contributions to the Warriors as a player um, and as a coach as well. So yeah, one of, only, chat. one of only two blokes that have featured in um, both of our grand finals as a player in 02 and a coach in 11 and Lance O'Hire, the only other one as a player in both. Um, yeah, spoke to Ivan yesterday. Uh, he's on a bit of a, a year break at the moment, but once he gets back to Sydney, we'll we'll get him on. Uh, and another one that we're in the process of lining up to is um, is our 2000 Player of the Year, Robbie Mears, uh, going to come on for a bit of a chat as well. Um, so yeah, excited, it, it, very exciting that we can get you know con uh, we can get in contact with these guys and get them on the show and have a bit of a chat. Um, yeah, so it's going to be. It's going to be great. Don't know if the cyborg will come on. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to be a double double act, but uh, we'll be happy enough to have Ivan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll be a good one. Um, yeah. And, uh, before we go, uh, that we're on Patreon, uh, our membership platform that enables people to show their support for us and, and content by signing up for a monthly subscription. Uh, Patreon supports multiple tier levels uh, to suit all budgets, and each tier has its own rewards and benefits. And now we're up and running. Yeah, that's right. And uh, you can head to our Patreon page. The link is on the screen right now to show your support and subscribe to our bronze tier, which which is set the lowest amount possible. And that's just three dollars a month, uh, which is next to nothing. Um, we've also partnered with Torius Screen Print as well. And we're in the process of producing our range of merchandise, which will uh, be available soon. And we will have some exclusive Patreon only merchandise. Give you a little hint. There's going to be a uh, a legend shirt, a Ruin Hammer legend shirt at some point. Yep. So yep. there you go. But that's Patreon only merchandise. And that's for our silver, gold, platinum, and diamond level Patreon tiers in the coming weeks. And the exclusive, as we said, exclusive Patreon merchandise will not be for sale and will only be available to our Patreon subscribers. Yeah, um, that's right, mate. And we'd like to thank those who have subscribed to our, our bronze tier program so far. Uh, Daniel Delore, Peri. Falconer, 
Sean Kuhl, uh, the Kirch, uh, Nick McKercher, Mary Carter, Fabian Moroa, Siala from Asonga, our good mate Steve Williams from over there in uh, in Perth, Christian Catley and Alf Tave. Thank you all very much. We appreciate all your support. Yeah, we, we definitely appreciate you guys for supporting us there. We can't do it without you and, and all you guys that, that watch and um, comment and join the conversation each, each week. So we, we much love to all of you. Um, yeah. Don't, don't forget, though, if you do miss any of our live shows, you can always catch up on our Facebook page by going to the video section. You can go to our YouTube channel and catch up there because it's simulcast through Facebook and YouTube. Um, the easiest way, though, to find our videos is to head to our link tree, which has uh, special uh, destinations. The, the link tree link is up on the screen now. Yep. And... Um, yeah, don't don't forget to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel as well, uh, so you'll never miss any of our streamed content. And you know, it doesn't cost anything. You know. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't. And yeah, go to Linktree. Linktree's got uh, direct links to every one of our live guest interviews uh, and and special presentations we've done. If you're a podcast fan, you can catch all our episodes on our past podcast platforms: Spotify, Apple, Google, Breaker, uh, Radio Direct, iHeartRadio. Make sure you subscribe to us there. Uh, we upload those episodes um, so they're ready to listen to every Thursday morning. And we thank those that continually support us on those um, on those podcast platforms. And please head to our Ruin Hammer Instagram page uh, where we upload content daily to, to keep our followers informed of upcoming events, uh, Warriors news, player movements, and all other Warriors-related content. Well, mate, that's it for another great show. And look, we, we again, we really want to thank our special guest, PJ Marsh, for coming on for a chat tonight. And again, thank all of you guys who continue to support Ruin Hammer. It Again, it really is very much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your support. Um, we look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday night with uh, Kiwi legend Mark Graham uh, here with us. So um, until then, everyone stay safe and... Um, yeah, go the Warriors. Jeez, guys, go the Warriors.